Good morning. Uh, seeing that the board members are now present, Brooks, will you please call the roll to establish a quorum? Good morning. Member Yoshimoto Tauri. Present. Member Rodriguez. Here. Member Porter. Here. Member Patillo Brownson. Here. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Here. Member Olkin. Here. Member McQuillan. Good morning, here. Member Lewis. Here. Vice President Glover Woods. Here. Member Escobedo. Here. President Darlene Hammond. Here. Everyone's present. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, I hereby call the January 2023 meeting of the State Board of Education to order at 8.31 a.m. And I'd like us to commence by saluting the flag. Member Lewis, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes. Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to State Superintendent Tony Thurman. Good morning, uh, Madam President, members of the board. Uh, it is my honor now um, to swear in uh, Dr. Linda Darling Hammond uh, to continue a, a new four-year term as a board member of the State Board of Education. Uh, are you ready to begin? I am ready. Very good. If you would, uh, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Linda Darling Hammond. I, Linda Darling Hammond. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States against. I'm sorry, the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter upon which I am about to enter congratulations thank you so much much appreciated and I will now uh, administer the oath to member Escobedo and uh, congratulations, uh, Francisco. Uh, please raise your right hand uh, and repeat after me. I, Francisco Escobedo. Uh, you're on mute. I, there Francisco Escobedo. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. I will take this obligation freely without any mental without any mental reservation without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion or purpose of of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge and I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter the duties upon which I am about to enter thank you member escobedo would you like to <laughs> would you like to say a few words? Oh, surely. It's been a privilege to 
be part of this uh, board for the last year and a half. And I look forward to another four years. We're definitely at an exciting time, you know, as we going through this post pandemic, um, you know, era and, and truly look forward to working with not only amazing colleagues that I, you know, feel very close to, but also an amazing staff that has been just a great support. And um, I know that we collectively will make a significant um, enhancement in the lives of our teachers and the lives of, you know, millions of students in California. So it's a truly a privilege to serve on this board. And it is wonderful to have you and all of the other members here. We have a lot of important work to do. Uh, and with that, we'll launch into item one, uh, our state board projects and priorities item to take up the annual election of officers only. Um, the state board staff recommends that the SBE take up the annual election of officers, and we will hold an election now for the position of president and vice president for 2023. The bylaws require that the state superintendent preside over the election of the president. Uh, superintendent, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you. Just one moment, please. Okay, we shall begin. In keeping with Article 4 of the state's board's bylaws, I would like to call for nominations for the office of president. No member may nominate or second the nomination for himself or herself. Six votes are necessary to elect an officer, and each officer elected shall serve for one year or until his or her successor is elected. I will now open the floor for nominations for the office of president. Are there any nominations? Superintendent Thurman, I'd like to make a nomination, please. I'd Wait, like no, to no. nominate, thank you, thank you. I'd like to nominate nominate uh, Linda Darling-Hammond for the office of president. Thank you, board member Glover Woods. Is there a second to this nomination? I'd second. like a second. Oh. There is a second. I will now open the floor uh, for voting. Uh, now that we have a second, uh, we will also open the role for, uh, for any public comment. And for members of the public wishing to provide public comment on this item, you can do so by calling the telephone number that you now will see on your screen. Um, and so uh, let me turn uh, to you, Brooks and staff. Are there any uh, individuals are requesting to provide public comment. No, we currently do not have anybody um, in the queue for public comment. Very good, thank you for that. Um, uh, seeing that there is no public comment, that we have a nomination and a second. Uh, uh, Brooks, would you please call the roll? Member Yoshimara Tauri. Yes. Member Rodriguez. Yes. Member Porter. Yes. Member Patillo Brownson. Enthusiastic, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Member Roscoe Gonzalez. Yeah. Member Olkin. Yes. Member McQuillan. Aye. Member Lewis. Yes. Vice President Glover Woods. Yes. Member Escobedo. Yes. President Darlene Hammond. Yes. Passes unanimously. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, reserve my comments until the uh, president's report, but I am truly grateful for the opportunity to be uh, a part of the great work that we are doing on this board and working closely with Superintendent Thurman. So I'm uh, pleased to be taking this on for another year, and I will now open the floor for nominations for the Office of Vice President. 
Uh, are there any nominations? Um, yes. Rodriguez. I would like to nominate uh, member Glover Woods. Is there a second for that nomination? Member Olkin, thank you. Um, and I guess at this point, we display the public comment slide again in case there are any further public comments as we still have it up. If anyone wants to make a comment, please uh, call the telephone number and use the access code provided on the slide that is shown now. And do we have any public comment? No, we do not. All right. Um, Brooks, can you please call the roll? Member Yoshimoto Towering. Yes. Member Rodriguez. Yes. Member Porter. Yes. Member Patillo Brownson. Smiling beneath my mask. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Member Roscoe Gonzalez. Yes. Member Olkin. Yes. Member McQuillan. Yes. Member Lewis. Yes. Vice President Glover Woods. Yes. Member Escobedo. Yes. President Darlene Hammond. And another enthusiastic yes. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations, <laughs> unanimously. Um, it is my pleasure to announce Cynthia Glover Woods as Vice President for 2023. Uh, congratulations. Uh, and with that auspicious start, um, do you want to say anything before we get going? Just um, how honored I am to be able to serve on the board and um, how extremely honored I am to be able to serve as vice president for this year. Thank you so very much for the support. We appreciate all that you are doing uh, and that you will do <laughs> in the year to come. Um, now for general announcements. There is a one item on the agenda that has an addendum. Item one, the 2023 State Board Screening Committee recommendations regarding appointments to the Advisory Commission on Charter Schools, the California Practitioners Advisory Group, and the Instructional Quality Commission. Uh, in terms of the consent calendars, the proposed waiver consent items are W1 through W5, and the proposed regular consent items are items six through nine. Uh, there are no public hearings on this agenda. Uh, and then we have one um, change in the agenda. We'll reopen item one, state board priorities, shortly to hear reports from the state superintendent and myself. And we'll reopen item one again tomorrow to take action on the preliminary report of actions, draft November 2022 meeting minutes, to take up appointments to advisory commissions and to report on our liaison assignments. Uh, members of the public who wish to call in for public comment should view the live stream of the meeting to know at what time public comment will occur for each item. Public comment may be uh, provided by dialing the phone number and entering the participant access code, then following each of the operator's prompts. Upon dialing in, callers will be added to a caller queue the operator will notify callers when it is their turn to provide public comment. We'll also ask callers to please turn down the speaker volume of their computers if they are following the live webcast to avoid an echoing effect. Public comment will be limited to one minute per speaker. Item 13 is the general public comment item during which members of the public may provide comment on matters that are not specifically listed on the board's agenda. Board members, please mute your microphones when not speaking. Keep your cameras on, except during the scheduled breaks to ensure that we maintain a quorum throughout today's virtual meeting. And for each item on the agenda, there will be an opportunity for board members to raise their Zoom hand if they would like to ask a question or make a comment. And so we'll now reopen item one and turn it over to State Superintendent Tony Thurmond to provide his report. Superintendent Thurmond. Thank you, uh, Madam President, and congratulations again uh, to you, President Darling Hammond, and to Vice President Glover Woods. And i um, honored to work and serve with you both and to all of the members of the board. Uh, as this is the first time that we are together um, in this new year, I wanna say Happy New Year to you all. And I'm thinking back to just the last few days where we, uh, celebrated the memory, legacy, and honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And um, it is with that 
uh, memory that I think of a spirit of hopefulness uh, for our state and for the state of education, for our nation and for our world. Um, I think often of the a quote that Dr. King said that everyone can be great because anyone can serve. And in that way, I thank you all for serving the students and families of California. Um, I'd like to um, start out by talking about um, a wonderful um, honor that we have starting next month to recognize uh, uh, 256 distinguished schools in the state of California. Um, these are schools that have demonstrated academic success in supporting our students, and it has been a tradition in California to celebrate uh, these schools in February in Disneyland. And this will be the first time that these schools can be in person um, uh, since the pandemic. And we certainly invite you uh, to join us in recognizing the distinguished schools for their great honor and for what their work represents for what we can do for other students in the state. Uh, some of those students are students who you probably saw were impacted um, during the pandemic. And we saw some of those <clears throat> reflections during um, the presentations uh, about the, uh, the dashboard and chronic absenteeism in particular and seeing that for many students, absenteeism rates have increased. And because of that, the Department of Education, we've uh, kicked off a series on how to address chronic absenteeism. And, um, our first uh, of many webinars was held yesterday with a number of districts sharing best practices for things that they've done before the pandemic, during the pandemic and post pandemic to address the needs of our students. We all know that during the pandemic, many of our families were food insecure. Our schools served more than 800 million meals uh, during the pandemic. We know that there's been a spike in depression and anxiety for many of our students. I had a chance to do some home visits just a few weeks ago with families who were chronically absent. And I'd like to thank the folks um, at Mount Diablo Unified for allowing me to join their team. And I heard consistently the impacts of the pandemic and depression, um, uh, you know, housing, insecurity, you name it, all the things that our families are facing. But we know that they're more than the sum of their circumstances. And there are ways that our schools can support our families. And this state has provided great resources in our state budget to do that, not the least of which is a 13% increase in LCFF and other resources that can be used to support outreach and, and support. And so we will continue to lift up examples of ways to support our schools and um, how to provide engaging uh, instruction and programs that help our students um, to accelerate their learning when they have returned to school. Um, we're also busy with our efforts to support uh, teacher recruitment in our state. And within days, we'll be making some announcements about a new public service announcement campaign to help uh, reach those uh, who would be interested in becoming a teacher in California, to make them aware of the great resources that we have, like a $20,000 scholarship, a grant um, for anyone who wants to uh, become a teacher or to become a counselor in our schools. Dr. Darling Hammond and others have worked very closely to make this happen. And uh, we are actively engaging many uh, who would be interested in serving. Those who are in AmeriCorps programs, those who are working as tutors, those who work as classified staff, those who work in expanded learning to make sure that they can get connected to all the resources that exist um, to become uh, a teacher. And so uh, we'll be making announcements uh, about that uh, in, the, in the days to come. And so we want to continue in a spirit of hopefulness um, about the things that we can do to overcome the challenges of the last few years. Today in, uh, on this agenda, you'll hear an update on the efforts to implement our universal transitional kindergarten program. Uh, groundbreaking that no other state has found a way to guarantee preschool for every four-year-old in our state. And we look at every aspect of early education and opportunities uh, for our students. Related, I would just point out that the governor's proposed budget uh, speaks to many that, uh, items that many of you have spoken to as priorities, including um, a proposal to provide an additional allocation for uh, providing reading coaches and specialists at California schools, $250 million to build on what was in last year's budget 
another proposal for doing that. And as we're working to implement it, again, just the spirit of hopefulness that this is a great opportunity for California and it builds on a, a series of learning acceleration webinars that we have been implementing and uh, many of you have been a part of. See if we get some technical help. Sounds like the echoing is stopping. Well, well if it's good news, let the good news echo and resound. Um, <laughs> that we have big challenges on the horizon, but we have the resources and the willpower and the political will to make this happen for California students. And so with that, I will say that um, we're prepared to work closely with this board I would mention that we have um, one new staff uh, person to uh, announce and um, it's someone that you know, um, you will see him uh, on a regular basis and you probably have seen him in our in our legal team. Uh, Bruce Yonahiro has um, been promoted um, to fill one of the vacancies of our uh, deputy legal counsel and uh, you will have the opportunity to work with him and we look forward to making an announcement for you shortly about our new general counsel um, in the days to come. Uh, this concludes my report. Thank you so much. And thank you, Superintendent Thurman. Congratulations on your inauguration and reelection. Uh, I am honored to serve with you. It's been a pleasure as we tackle so many issues together and your passion for the children and educators in this state is uh, inspiring. Uh, and necessary as we engage in all of this problem solving. So uh, thrilled that you are um, with us for another four years as well. And um, I wanted to say, I appreciate Governor Newsom appointing me to a, serve a second term at this critical time when we are facing so many challenges and also making so much progress as Superintendent Thurman just described. Um, I'm grateful to my colleagues on the board for all of your ongoing commitment to the path toward a shared vision of schools that serve the whole child, that empower families, that support educators, and that enlist the help of the whole community in joyful and purposeful learning. Uh, as you know, schools are at the heart of uh, any community and our work to build this whole child framework, one in which students are supported in their health and well-being, as well as their academic studies, is important to supporting communities in good times and in challenging times like those we've been experiencing. And as you know, in addition to the challenges of COVID-19 over the last nearly three years now, the effects of climate change are being felt regularly across the state. These past few weeks, the intense winter storms were devastating for so many. Lives were lost, homes were lost, businesses were destroyed. Uh, at one point, 429 schools were closed affecting 185,000 students across 19 counties. This is just over 3% of the students in California. And most of those campuses resumed operations fairly quickly, uh, in part due to the great efforts of the staff of many state agencies, including the Department of Education and uh, the State Board. Uh, but the storms will continue to be felt, and there is one town that's been uh, almost entirely evacuated, and. Uh, we will continue to feel the effects of the storms for many, many weeks to come. And I'm certainly uh, want to express uh, both uh, empathy and gratitude to the many teachers and principals and school site staff and parents and students who came together to both weather these storms and to support these families and children and to focus on safety in our schools. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that these storm systems, along with the drought and fires that we've been experiencing, will continue, even as our state leaders and many of our school system leaders are working proactively to limit challenges to our environment, to move us from fossil fuels to a clean energy future. We have fleets of electric buses, school buses across the state, and many schools being renovated. But um, as we continue to cope with these challenges, it's going to be important for us, I think, to further develop the work that we began when COVID first arrived for instructional continuity. And we passed a requirement that um, districts create instructional continuity plans 
um, and to um, activate uh, efforts to close the digital divide. Superintendent Thurman and the governor and the uh, first partner all, and I all worked very hard on that. And then the legislature uh, and the federal government finally kind of came online. But we're going to need to build on those efforts so that we can uh, provide for instructional continuity, find ways to be flexible and fast on our feet in the use of technologies for learning. And when a uh, physical presence is disrupted, uh, and this is true whether it's for an individual student who has to be, who's out because they are unwell or they're needing to be quarantined, or, or whether it is for an entire school or town as in some of these instances. Given all that we've done to close uh, the digital divide, we should be seeking ways to ensure that learning is never short-circuited and that we can use these tools to ensure access to learning materials and opportunities. So we'll be launching a conversation to explore how we can enable this kind of support for students and schools. Fortunately, Governor Newsom's budget that was released last week demonstrates the strong commitment both to further environmental progress and to further educational progress uh, in the state with um, the whole child approach that's so necessary to helping students weather these kinds of events. Uh, despite the revenue being down, uh, governor's budget maintains strong fiscal support for schools, continues the programs that we've already launched to accelerate learning uh, and address troubling disparities by strengthening our, our state's commitment to equity. Uh, both the investments in the Proposition 98 Rainy Day Fund and the allocation of one-time funds over a five to seven year period, as we have seen with community schools and the recruitment and retention funds for educators will provide that continuing support for initiatives. The budget allows for all of these future minded investments to continue. A universal preschool, as Superintendent Thurman noted, community schools, physical and mental health services, after school and summer school programs, intensive tutoring programs. Uh, all of these will be critical to ongoing learning recovery. And we've already begun to see the effects of these investments in the steeper than normal gains in English language arts and math that we saw last year for the 740,000 students who took the state uh, Smarter Balance tests in 2021 and 2022. If we maintain those kinds of steep gains, uh, we will rapidly uh, return to the trajectory, the positive trajectory that schools have been on. Uh, this year's substantial increase in the local control funding formula, despite that tough fiscal picture overall, provides that solid foundation for our education system. Uh, you know that we've moved from a highly inequitable and inadequate system of funding before 2013. We were among, if you account for cost of living, we were the last in the nation in spending. Now we are above the national average and we are beginning to see uh, the gains and outcomes that accompany those investments. It's also heartening to see in a, an investment in a literacy roadmap, which will create a cohesive blueprint for uh, improving reading and writing instruction, uh, bringing together the proven strategies, the evidence-based strategies uh, that we know of that are articulated in our very lengthy ELA, ELD framework uh, and make them more concrete and applicable with instructional supports for teachers and for the literacy coaches that superintendent uh, noted we will be expanding. Uh, the uh, governor and the administration have focused on our most vulnerable students through the LCFF equity multiplier. This next development in the local control funding formula uh, will uh, strengthen equity by supporting schools that serve the very neediest students uh, in a way that should fortify uh, our resolve to attack disparities for the betterment of all. And we'll be seeing some uh, accompanying efforts to focus in our uh, local control accountability plans on being sure that students who are struggling uh, are identified and their needs being met. In addition to the good news in the budget, we have some good news here at the State Board. This month, we welcome three new staff members. Uh, Chief Counsel Kieran Gill, uh, Senior Policy Director Laura Rodriguez, and Assistant Policy Director Michelle Valdivia. We have a terrific team. I'm excited we're strengthening our ranks further with these highly qualified individuals. Kieran comes to us from the Attorney General's office where she served as a Deputy Attorney General representing state agencies in the areas of education, health and welfare programs uh, and state and federal litigation uh, cases since 2018. She received the 2021 AG Award for Excellence in COVID-19 litigation 
uh, and the 2021 Civil Division recognition for competency restoration defense. And just last week was recognized for her work as a member of the education litigation team at the 2022 Civil Division recognition ceremony. Laura uh, comes to us from the College Board, where she was Senior Director for Government Relations and served as an internal content expert on California assessment policy, among other responsibilities. This will come in very handy as she continues to take responsibility for us uh, for the assessment CTE and Golden State Pathways assignments. Uh, uh, Michelle has been a Department of Finance Fiscal Analyst since 2018. She has deep experience in analyzing, reviewing, and making recommendations on fiscal affairs and analyzing legislation, preparing memos, and representing the Department of Finance before the legislature. Uh, Michelle is a former California Senate, Senate Fellow and AmeriCorps member. She holds a bachelor's degree in social welfare from UC Berkeley. So welcome to all three of these new staff. And finally... Yes, uh, we can take a moment to applaud them and we will have other moments to appreciate them over the coming year. <laughs> um, and then I need to express my profound appreciation and a bit of bittersweet sadness for um, State Policy P Director Leila Faimudin, who is moving on to other pursuits at the end of the month. Uh, Leila has been a fearless champion for our students, especially our English learners and students with disabilities. She's been a courageous voice for more equitable practices in our K-12 system. She has a strong moral compass. She keeps students at the forefront of all of her work. Uh, she reminds us of the importance of student voice and bringing those that we serve to the decision-making table. Uh, she puts equity first and knows that the future of the state depends on us closing the achievement gaps that we experience. Uh, Layla is a system thinker who connects the dots and she's been very instrumental to our work to bridge health services and education supports and create the infrastructure needed to make the Child Youth Behavioral Health Initiative a success. She's been a stalwart on the state board team, quick to help colleagues and dig in wherever necessary. And I know that I speak for all of us in saying we'll miss her wit and her problem solving and her occasional baked goods. Um, and Brooks, I think you have a certificate for Layla. So we want uh, to join me in a round of applause and uh, pass the ball to Brooks to award the certificate. Thank you, President Darlene Hammond. The certificate has been delivered. And I'm actually not sure if this is a physical certificate or a virtual certificate at the moment. It is a, it is a physical um, certificate so, that we just handed over. Uh, Brooks, let us know how you want to proceed. I, I think uh, we just got a big expression of, of gratitude and thanks. And uh, just got a big Looks smile. like something is happening in the boardroom. President Darling Hammond, can you hear us now? Somebody needs to make a selection. Brooks, I don't know if you are um, near a microphone to let us know President Darling Hammond, how can you, you hear want us to now? proceed. I can hear you now. Okay, uh, we apologize. The boardroom was muted. Um, it was it was such an overwhelmingly response of gratitude uh, for, for Layla uh, that apparently we knocked out the mics. Um, <laughs> So she, she has received her physical certificate um, and she gave us a, a, a large smile and double thumbs up and we are all trying to contain our um, appreciation as well as uh, our, our sadness uh, that she's departing. But we are, we are yeah. ready for the next item. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Layla, wherever you are. <laughs> um, we're gonna move on to item two. Item two is the 2023 United States Senate Youth Program. Uh, and we're gonna be recognizing California's selected student delegates and alternates. Uh, the CDE recommends that we um, 
present the 2023 United States Senate Youth Program and recognize the 2023 delegates and alternates. And this item will be presented by Dina Fong of the CDE. Dina, uh, please begin. And we're not hearing anything uh, from the boardroom at the moment. So just letting you know that the mics need to come on. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Good morning, President Darling Hammond, State Superintendent Thurman, and honorable board members. I'm Dina Fong, the United States Senate Youth Coordinator for California and work in our uh, California Department of Education's Communications Division. I'm honored to be here today to introduce and recognize our 2023 U.S. Senate Youth students. The U.S. Senate Youth Program is sponsored by the U.S. Senate and funded and administered by the William Randolph Hearst Foundation. Now in its 61st year, the program provides an opportunity to selected students to gain an in-depth view of the Senate and the federal government, as well as provide a foundation for those considering a future in public service on the local, state, or national level. High school juniors and seniors are nominated by their principal to apply for this highly competitive merit-based program. To qualify, students must currently be serving in an elected or appointed leadership position in student government or a civic or educational organization representing a constituency and serving others for the entire school year. Our students have gone through a rigor rigorous application process and were selected based upon their leadership qualities, academic achievement, school and community involvement, and commitment to public service. The last phase of the program is to formally present our 2023 U.S. Senate Youth Delegates and Alternates. These students are among the best of the best in their school, community, and the state. There is no doubt that they will succeed in whatever they do and will serve their communities with passion. Our two delegates will represent California during Washington Week in Washington, D.C. from March 4th to 11th, where they will participate in a comprehensive public service leadership and education experience, including speakers from the hearing from speakers from the three branches of government and the national media. The delegates will each receive a $10,000 college scholarship for undergraduate studies with encouragement to study coursework in political science or history. Now I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce each student and give them each time to say a few words. Our first delegate is Fiona Liu, a senior at Northwood High School in Irvine. She has been described as someone with an insatiable thirst for knowledge who is not afraid to confidently voice her ideas and approaches topics with an open mind and eagerness to learn. Fiona serves as the policy director of the California High School Democrats. In that position, she helped launch the organization's inaugural legislative platform by supporting youth-related bills on behalf of their members and created a legislative advisory committee to improve the democratic process in supporting bills. Fiona is one of three students from her school on the Irvine Unified School District Student Advisory Committee, where she advocates for mental health initiatives and student board member representation. She is a member of the California Department of Education's Youth Advisory Council as part of the communications and legislative team and has also interned for Assemblywoman Cotty Petrie Norris. Her community activities include serving as partnership director for Generation Upwards and as a co-lead and project manager of a local chapter of Dear Asian Youth, for which she researched a book available in different Asian languages that show people how to report hate crimes. Fiona wants to explore majors in comparative studies and race and ethnicity, public policy and education, and learn about race and its intersection in every aspect of society. She has a passion to support the underserved and advocate for progressive policies to help marginalized groups stand in solidarity. Congratulations, Fiona. I'll turn it over to you for a few words. Thank you so much, Dina. And I just wanted to start off by saying how grateful I am for this chance to represent California on a national level and learn from some of the most distinguished people in this country who are and continue to be the trailblazers I look up to in my public service career. And with this learning opportunity, I'm excited to 
further my goals in learning how young people and future generations can engage in both local, state, and federal policy and use this as a change-making vehicle. I like to do this with an emphasis on racial justice, which I'm very passionate about, and making systemic change for low-income communities, especially in healthcare and education access. And along my journey, I like to remind myself what public service means to me, and that's investing back in the communities that have fostered so much growth within myself throughout my life, and also branching out to other communities to learn and unlearn and um, fight for equity and solidarity. So thank you so much. Thank you, Fiona. Our second delegate is Summer Sun, a senior at Chico High School in Chico. She has been described as a great example of a humble, quiet leader who leads by modeling hard work and supportive energies. Positivity radiates whenever she's around and she naturally inspires others. Summer is ASB president at her school, where she oversees school-wide functions and student activities and reports at district board meetings. She has been in student government every year since ninth grade and has served as class president, ASB secretary, and the school site council. She is the president of the Students Organized Friendship Alliance Club, whose mission is to practice social skills with special education students and create a safe space to celebrate everyone's differences. She founded Read to Rise, a nonprofit global youth reading program in the local community, Haiti and China, that raises funds to donate books and supplies for children in poverty and pairs high school students in, as reading pals for 200 local kids from economically disadvantaged families. Her passion for volunteerism has earned her the President's Volunteer Service Gold Award and as her school's delegate for Girl, Girl State, an Outstanding Citizenship Award for Leadership, Kindness, and Integrity. She plans to major in cultural anthropology with possible minors in public policy or international relations, followed by a graduate program in law and government. She is committed to improving the lives of underrepresented groups and minorities. Congratulations, Summer. Please say a few words. Hello, everyone. I just want to say I'm so happy to be here. Um, thank you so much for this amazing opportunity to attend the Senate Youth Program. I just wanted to first thank my teachers, counselor, principal, and also my superintendent for not just supporting me through the application process, but all throughout my years of education, because I would not be here without them. I think to me, public service means taking personal experiences and transforming them into positive impacts. I think that everyone has their own unique story that then allows them to identify needs in their community and serve in a way that really only they can. I think I honestly just can't believe that I'm going to be in D.C. in less than two months. I think this firsthand experience on how our government works is just truly so special. And most importantly, I'm excited to learn how to use what I learned to better serve underrepresented groups in my community and my country. So Thank you again for this amazing opportunity. I really cannot express enough how grateful I am. Thank you, Summer. If Fiona or Summer should be unable to participate in Washington Week, then one of our alternates will take their place. Our first alternate is Nathaniel Nate Watts, a senior at Carlsbad High School in Carlsbad. He has been described as an exceptional human being and a natural leader committed to service who has the rare qualities of calm, balance, and good humor, which allow him to excel without burning out. Nate serves as a student representative for the Superintendent's Student Advisory Council at Carlsbad Unified, where he represents student interests and provides feedback to the district superintendent and the leadership team. He serves as president and captain of the speech and debate team, vice president of the Indian Culture Club and mock trial, a delegate of the Model United Nations, and first baseman of the baseball team. Nate was also recognized as his team's most inspirational player. He mentors younger students on the debate team as well as elementary students through the Carlsbad Unified Champions, a district-wide group of students. Nate developed a strong interest in politics and civic engagement during his time as a Democratic Congressional Campaign Summer Fellow, where he participated in voter registration, strategizing, organizing town halls, and inspiring youth involvement in politics. A National Merit Semifinalist and AP Scholar with Honors, 
Nate is only one of 22 students worldwide who has achieved a perfect score on the AP English language exam. He hopes to study political science and international relations with a focus on the impacts and mitigation of environmental crises. He wants to dedicate his life to public service to create safer, sustainable communities for generations to come. Congratulations, Nate. Please say a few words. Hi, everyone. I just want to say I'm, I'm truly grateful for this opportunity. Um, I want to take this time to, to thank Ms. Fong, Superintendent Thurmond, President Hammond, uh, my parents, probably most importantly, as well as everyone back at, at Carlsbad Unified. Um, service to me honestly looks like using opportunities in the present to build a better future by, by correcting our mistakes in the past. Um, and in the short term for me, that, that looks like continuing to work with my local congressman, Mike Levin, uh, to build a better life for us here in the 49th district. But then hopefully in the future, in, in a time past college, I really wanna work on, on the climate crisis and working on, on building my generation's solutions to that problem. So uh, thank you everyone for this opportunity and have a, have a blessed rest of your day. Thank you, Nate. Our second alternate is Sabrina Brandeis, a senior at Monte Vista High School in Danville. She is described as a team player who is thoughtful, exhibits grace under pressure, concerned about the greater good, and hopes to make a difference. Sabrina serves as a youth commissioner on the Danville Parks and Recreation Commission and represents Danville's teams in the planning of recreational activities and the management of parks, as well as participating in decisions that improve Danville's public spaces. She has also served on the Danville Town Council for five years to represent the teen voice in her community through outreach and service projects. In response to anti-Semitic incidents, she and her sister created a project encouraging students to discuss intolerance in the, in, in the community, which led her to become the Stronger Than Hate Video Contest national winner. As speech captain of her school speech and debate team, she won first place nationally at the Yale Invitational, placed in the top 10 at the Tournament of Champions, and placed fourth in California. She was one of two women from California to represent the state as a senator in the American Legion Auxiliary Girls Nation Program and was chosen by staff as the most outstanding senator for 2022. A National Merit semifinalist, Sabrina would like to study political science, followed by law school and work for social justice and fight unjust policies and bring justice to those who need it. Congratulations, Sabrina. Please say a few words. I just wanted to start off by saying I'm so grateful to have been given this opportunity and have been chosen as an alternate for this program. As a child, I made some of my favorite memories attending the annual Danville Elf Workshop. It brought me so much joy to connect with the other kids in my community every year and, of course, enjoy the free hot chocolate. As president of the Danville Youth Council and youth commissioner of the Danville Parks and Recreation Commission, I've worked to recreate some of the joy and community engagement of the experiences that I enjoyed so much as a child. To me, public service is about connection. I take pride in connecting with people in my community about their experiences and what they see a need for. And as one of California's two delegates to Girls Nation, I formed connections with girls from all over the country, expanding my worldview with new experiences through conversations. I hope to continue working to foster connections and engagement in every community that I'm part of. I want to connect with communities and work to fight unjust policies. I believe that justice is achieved by first understanding the experiences of another. And in each connection I make, I hope to add to my understanding of my community and the world. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Once again, I'd like to again say congratulations to our four students. You are all doing amazing things in your communities, and I look forward to seeing what's next. What I've shared today is just a small sampling of their many accomplishments. We would be here all day if I shared everything they're involved in. I also want to add that all of the students have been described by their advisor, teacher, principal, or superintendent as someone who definitely stands out from the rest as evidence from what you heard today. I think we can surely feel confident and encouraged that these outstanding students are shining examples of our future and they will go on to do more great things and make a positive difference in our world. I'll turn this back to President Darling Hammond and State Superintendent Thurman and the other board members to offer their congratulations. Thank you very much.
congratulations to all of you. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay. Uh, and you know, we really appreciate the level of uh, commitment the, to con contributing that you expressed and the wisdom uh, that we heard from each of you. Um, we're going to put the public comment slide up while I pass the ball to Superintendent Thurman to say a few words uh, so that others can also call in and uh, congratulate you. Superintendent Thurmond. Uh, thank you, President Darlingham. And I just wanted to say congratulations, uh, Fiona and Summer and Nate and Sabrina uh, for uh, your, your incredible accomplishments in your local community and your schools and what you're now doing on behalf of the state of California. And um, what you've done already is so impressive and the things that you've laid out for yourselves, racial justice, environmental justice, public service, you know, it's just so inspiring and so hopeful. And uh, we know that you're gonna do great things. And I suspect that one day we're all gonna end up working for you at some point. And um, as someone who started in, in um, student government, um, I just wanna encourage you to continue doing this. Look how it's opening doors for you and the communities that you serve. Um, we couldn't be more proud. Congratulations to you and your families. And thank you um, for taking up the, um, the, the call um, to serve. Um, as I opened with, Dr. King said, everyone can be great because anyone can serve. You're showing your greatness for you, your families, your community, and our state. So congratulations. I uh, thank you, Dina, to you and your team um, for helping to uh, shepherd this process and to bring forward uh, these incredible leaders. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back to uh, President Darling Hammond. Thank you. Uh, and plus one to all of that. Uh, we do have the public comments slide up, and I want to see if there is any public comment, anyone who wants to make a comment can call the number shown on the slide and dial the access code. The operator will let you know when you're uh, avail uh, online. Is there any public comment? Uh, we do not have anyone in the queue for a public comment. All right. And so now I can open it up to the board members who I know have uh, some um, congratulations to offer. We're gonna start with member Porter. Hello everyone, Fiona, Nate, Sabrina, Summer, congratulations on behalf of all the students of California. I just wanna say thank you for your commitment. Each of you is working in such niche areas, but something that really resonated with me through all of your speeches is your emphasis on empathy and community-centered conversations and dialogue. And I just wanna to continue to um, encourage you to use your voice for good, um, speak up for those who can't, and congratulations for representing our state at the highest level. Terrific, thank you. Member Rodriguez. Thank you, good morning. I would also like to take this moment to congratulate you and to let you know how uh, inspired I am uh, with your level of commitment to service and service of others. Uh, your kindness and compassion is something that really touches me and your, your intentional leadership. Uh, it has filled me with hope this morning. I wish you all the best. And as Superintendent Thurmond uh, said, we will uh, definitely all be working for you someday. Uh, your, <laughs> and your leadership is fantastic and thoughtful. So um, I look forward to seeing what you do and what you continue to do because you've already achieved so much. And Member Lewis. Thank you. I think you're going to keep hearing this resonate throughout all the board members, how impressed we are with what we've heard that you've already accomplished and the dreams you have for yourselves, for your community. I just love some of the, the things that you talked about, equity, solidarity, solidarity, and giving a voice to the underrepresented. I, it's just, it is so encouraging just to see the passion that you as young people have and all of the things that you've done that people at my age never thought about doing when we were in high school. I mean, you've accomplished so much and there's no doubt in my mind that you're gonna fulfill all of the dreams and you speak with such passion that I know that you're gonna do all of these great things that you wanna do for your community. And as some of you said, for the nation. So I just appreciate you and congratulations to you for your appointment. And I know that you're gonna do well and represent California well. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Member Lewis, um, Member Glover Woods, and then Member Olkin, and then Member Orozco Gonzalez. 
Thank you. And I just will say ditto, ditto, ditto. I second and third those emotions. Um, all of you young people are absolutely amazing. And first, let me say congratulations to you for uh, being the cream that has risen to the top in this particular area and being that voice. I'm so excited about what you're doing in the present and really what you will be doing in the future. Being that voice for the voiceless in all of those different areas that you've shared with us is something that we need. And um, I know your contribution now and your contribution as you continue to go forward is definitely, definitely, definitely going to make our world a better place. So again, I say congratulations to you. Wish you all the best as you go to Washington, whether you're serving there or serving here. I'm just happy you're serving. Congratulations once again. Thank you so much. Uh, Member Olkin. Thank you. Uh, I just want to echo again what uh, my colleagues have already said. Um, I spend um, my my day job is um, largely in a high school, and I get to see um, incredible young people every day. Um, and your um, your leadership, your sense of commitment to others. Uh, the thing I think that I love the most is your belief in the value of every person and wanting to foster conversations across difference um, and to show not just, uh, you know, how we're different, but what we have in common um, just really resonated with me. Um, and it it stands out. And it's it's why I think all of us on this board and all educators across our state do the work we do. Um, and so as we get ready for two days of, you know, meeting and thinking about things at a statewide level, getting back to what it's really about, which is you, uh, is the best possible start. So I want to thank you for all you've done. Good luck and congratulations. And thanks for inspiring us this morning. Uh, that's, that's already a huge gift that you've given us. Thank you. Uh, Member Orozco Gonzalez. I think ditto, right? Exactly what all our members said is I'm so impressed with all that you have accomplished. As a second grade teacher, I want to share your accomplishments with my class because you're extraordinary role models and it just gives me so much hope for our future. And I just think um, I love the passion of you sharing all your ideas and just your empathy, kindness and commitment to to what is ahead of and I'm so excited to see what the future holds for you because I know it's just not just bright but it's just illuminating so adelante to Washington and good luck and I know that you will just thrive and shine um, exemplary so congratulations thank you and remember Yoshimaru Tari Thank you, uh, Fiona, Summer, Nathaniel, and Sabrina. I just wanted to say I'm proud not only as an educator this morning, but also as a mother. Uh, you are such an inspiration. And what I notice is that as you've taken these leadership positions, you're, you expressed today that you're also very much a learner and very much a listener. And I think that's something that is has to be emphasized. Uh, because that's going to continue, continue you on your path and creating space for other people's voices. So I just wanted to say we're all behind you and uh, be courageous and keep going. Thank you. Here, here. Uh, thank you so much. We are so pleased to see you and uh, to send you off on this uh, adventure. As um, one of the board members said, you know, you're serving both uh, here and some of you in Washington and all of that contribution will make a difference. Um, with that, uh, I think we want to say congratulations. Um, I don't know if the photos that were to be taken have gotten taken, but hopefully they have. We'll take one second in case there's any more of that needed. And uh, we will uh, thank you so much for being with us this morning. And we're going to move on now to, um, we're going to conclude this information item. And thank you, Dina. I also want to say for all that you've done to make this possible. Uh, and move on to item number three. Uh, and item three is the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress and the English Language Proficiency Assessments for California Update. 
on program activities. Uh, this is an information item. There is no specific recommended action at this time. Uh, and the item will be presented by Cheryl Cotton and Mal Vang uh, of the CDE. Uh, Cheryl, uh, please begin. Good morning and Happy New Year, Superintendent Thurman, President Darling Hammond, Vice President Glover Woods, and board members. Again, my name is Cheryl Cotton. I'm Deputy Superintendent of our Instruction Measurement and Administration Branch. With me to today to present these items are Mal Vang, Director of the Assessment Development and Administration Division, and Tony Alpert, Executive Director of the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium. The item before you today is an information item. As we begin a new year, it seems fitting to take a moment and reflect on the great strides California has made in its statewide assessment system and to share with you what's on the horizon. We'll begin today with an update from both me and Dr. Vang on California's commitment to innovation and assessments that support teaching and learning. We'll then turn it over to Tony Alpert who will summarize the recent demonstration of concept study and resulting deeper learning resources in California of, of which California was an integral part. Two of the goals of California's statewide assessment system are to support, to support teaching and learning and incorporate technology where appropriate. California transitioned to the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress, or CAST, in 2014, and there have been numerous advancements throughout the past seven years. Over the next several slides, we will highlight accomplishments that have demonstrated California's commitment to innovation and assessments that support teaching and learning with a focus on the CASP and the English Language Proficiency Assessment for California, or LPAC. I would like to begin with a recent accomplishment regarding California's status in the federal assist assessment peer review process. I am happy to be able to start off the new year with some positive news regarding the peer review status of the CASP and LPAC summative assessments. Assessment peer review is a process during which the CDE submits documents to the U.S. Department of Education, or ED, demonstrating that California's assessments meet the federal requirements for val validity, reliability, and fairness established by the state's established four states by the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA. As new assessments become operational, the CDE must provide additional evidence for peer review, covering each assessment that is required under ESSA. Peer review is often an iterative process, with states submitting additional evidence to meet the requirements as evidence becomes available. In November, we were pleased to receive notice from the ED that our Smarter Balanced Summative Assessments in English Language Arts and Literacy, or ELA, and Mathematics fully met all requirements. This is a significant accomplishment for California, and we are grateful to staff at CDE, ETS, and the consortium for getting us to this result. We also received encouraging results from other assessments that were submitted in 2021 and 2022. Those assessments were the California Alternate Assessment, or CAAs, for ELA and Mathematics, the California Science Test, or CAST, and the Summative English Language Proficiency Assessments for California, or LPAC. Each assessment was rated as substantially meets peer review requirements, which means that most elements were fulfilled, but some additional documents are required in order to fully meet all requirements. In June of 2023, we will submit the additional evidence. In addition, we will be completing our first submissions for the summative LPAC, summative alternate LPAC, and CAA for science. The findings thus far in our peer review feedback reflect both the quality of the assessments themselves, as well as the quality of the evidence documents that were provided and presented for evaluation. The California assessment system, which includes both the CASP and the LPAC, has been many years in the making, and collectively they reflect California's commitment to innova innovation and assessments that support teaching and learning. And now I will turn it over to Mal Vang to provide some background on the development and administration of California's assessments. Thank you.
Thank you, Cheryl. Good morning. And uh, I'd like to express my Happy New Year greeting to you. Um, and congratulations, Superintendent Thurman. I want it on your reelection. I um, am happy to be uh, a part of this uh, organization. And um, just a couple other words of congratulations to our uh, President Darling Hammond and Vice President Glover Woods on your um, new roles or continuing in your new roles. Uh, I, as Cheryl mentioned, I'm Mao Vang. I'm the director for the Assessment Development and Administration Division at the California Department of Education. And I look forward to uh, working with, uh, continuing to work with all of you. With our um, next slide, I would like to just give a little background on the our transition as Cheryl uh, have uh, set the stage that as our um, the State Board of Education has adopted new um, standards in our state. For example, um, uh, we continue to uh, develop um, academic assessments to meet these challenging standards. And after the State Board's adoption of the Common Core State Standards in um, English Language Arts and, and Literacy and Mathematics in 2010, uh, the California California joined the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium um, in that academic year of 2020, 2010-2011. Uh, uh, with the understanding that, that uh, this would bring um, immense benefit uh, when, it, when we are joined um, and being a part of a, of a multi-state consortium. So by joining the Smarter Balanced Consortium, we offered, uh, we can offer at that time are nearly 300,000 educators in our state, a comprehensive assessment system that reached far beyond e, um, just the end of year summative assessments and focus on supporting teaching and learning. And it expanded the system to also include interim assessments and formative assessment resources that we never had before. And they're intended to be used by educators in a manner that best meets the needs of their students. So California's uh, previous assessment system prior to CAPS was the Standardized Testing and Reporting Program, or STAR, as many of you might remember. That came to an end in 2014, and in 2015, California officially transitioned to computer-based testing with the first operational administration of the Smarter Balanced Summative Assessments for uh, English Language Arts and Mathematics. And these assessments were our first use of computer adapted testing in statewide assessments, meaning that students receive um, items uh, customized to match their level of knowledge, resulting in more precise measures of student performance. And in addition, these assessments were the state's first use of innovative assessment types such as technology enhanced uh, items like drag and drop and graphing selective response, constructive response, including um, performance tasks as well. And then in 2017-18, um, the state's previous English language uh, development assessment program, which was called the California English Language Development Test, or SALT, was replaced by the LPAC. And that began with a paper pencil assessment and transition to online as well. So while the CDE offers a variety of CASP and LPAC related professional uh, learning opportunities each year, in 2019-20, uh, um, the CDE hosts the inaugural California Assessment Conference. And this change provided an opportunity for local educational agency staff to access through one event key elements of assessment related trainings offered by the CDE and hear directly from our colleagues or their colleagues throughout the state about how they are implementing parts of the state assessment system locally. And this mix of professional learning opportunities and sharing of local best practices was well received and it became an annual event hosted by the CDE through its contractor um, with its contract with the, California, the Sacramento uh, County Office of Education, excuse me. Um, in terms of developing our assessments to get to that first operational uh, administration, just offering a quick little timeline, 
uh, for the CASP and the LPAC. Uh, again, as each uh, set of standards were adopted, the, California, the uh, CDE worked with our uh, contractor, ETS, to develop and administer assessments that are aligned to these standards. And from the time that a set of standards is adopted, it can take several years until the assessments can be administered operationally. So, uh, and by operationally, I mean uh, the point at which the results from the assessment can be usable for the purpose of making determinations based on a score. And prior to the operational administration, a host of activities must occur from the development of a high level test design and blueprint to item development, uh, pilot testing and field testing. The first um, a CASP assessments um, operation, uh, that were administered operationally were the Smart Balance Summative Assessments. Um, and in that same year, uh, Smart Balance also launched the first set of interim assessments operationally, and then the Digital Library of Formative Assessment Tools. And although uh, being a member of the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium, California had access to the English language arts and mathematics assessments, um, we needed to design the, and develop and administer the science test, the alternate assessments for English, math and science, as well as the English language proficiency assessments. And many California teachers participated and their contributions were instrumental in the development of all of our statewide assessments. Uh, in each of these uh, years, in 2015-16, was the first operational uh, administration of our alternate assessments for English language arts and mathematics. And then in 2017-18, we had the, uh, through the 21st with the um, initial and summative LPAC assessments. They began with paper uh, format and transitioned to online. And then in 2018-19 was the first time we had the California Science Test and the Cal Spanish Assessment uh, operationally. And this past year in 2021-22 was when we finally have the California Alternate Assessment for Science uh, administered operationally. And the first uh, operational administration of our summative alternate LPAC occurred in the 2021 year. And the first operational administration of the initial LPAC is occurring this year in 2022-23. So the next assessment on the horizon to be expanded is our, the, ex, the expanded California assessment, uh, Spanish assessment which beginning in 2024-25, we will include the speaking and full write. And um, with that, uh, we continue to study uh, in terms of uh, innovations in progress, we continue to study and consider innovations to California's assessment system. And in 2021-22, uh, Smarter Balance conducted a demonstration of concept study to begin examining how performance tasks can support learning throughout the year. Shortly, uh, Tony Alper will be providing more information on that study. But the SBE, um, CDE, and ETS are laying the foundation by connecting with um, state assessment practitioners and national experts for the um, development of the CAST innovations concept study uh, paper excuse me, that will be brought before the board later this year. And uh, ETS and CD are also working toward implementing the CAST and LPAC interim assessments for the 23-24 school year. And implementing these assessments involve making many changes uh, to multiple systems, including but not limited to our test delivery system, teacher hand scoring system, data entry interface, and the California reporting, educator reporting system. So with that, uh, highlighting these innovations that are still in progress, I will turn this uh, presentation over to Tony Alper, uh, who will provide an overview of that recent demonstration of concept study and a group of resources that resulted from the study uh, called the, our Integrated Deeper Learning Resources. And Tony will be uh, presenting virtually. So Tony, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you, Mao, uh, and thank you, Cheryl, for the overview. It's, uh, I think, really powerful to have this conversation about innovation uh, with the understanding that California is taking these steps 
uh, from a position of strength uh, with a strong uh, uh, description of priorities and investment over a decade now uh, to transition to a more powerful system that doesn't just do an end of year check, but supports instruction throughout the year. Uh, and toward that end then, uh, consistent with what Mao described, uh, we collaborated with uh, uh, President, uh, State Board President uh, Linda Darling Hammond um, and uh, CDE and some other partners to really investigate what can we do more? Uh, what, how can we help more? Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, in addition to uh, the California Department and the State Board, uh, we also included some uh, partnerships, collaboration with the new Teacher Center, uh, who helped us address uh, the professional learning needs of educators as we consider uh, both changes to the system, to a system and maintenance to the system. So there's managing change and then there's supporting implementation, uh, which really uh, depends a lot on the information that we're able to provide uh, to teachers um, in advance and in during uh, the implementation of a system. And then WestEd supported our work uh, by helping develop some of the teacher resources uh, that were included in the demonstration. Next slide. Uh, as Mao described, uh, we uh, the, the primary purpose of this was to in investigate how can the Smart Balance Summit of Assessment uh, better support teaching and learning. Uh, and it was a grounding, a founding principle for the assessment system. And uh, we have tools for teachers and we have the interim assessments that more clearly support uh, the uh, improve support teachers as they improve their practice and support the individual needs of their students. Uh, but the summative assessment, that relationship isn't particularly clear during the year. There's uh, some, uh, it, it's more clear how it can be used after the year is over, uh, but we wanted to push uh, a little bit further. Uh, and um, in part, uh, the state board's request is we think about how we reduce the footprint of the end of the year test uh, while we spread that out a little bit uh, so that uh, districts might have more flexibility uh, in uh, providing data that supports a summative assessment and consistent uh, uh, data statewide but also doesn't concentrate it so much in a single point in time to make it uh, all work a little bit easier. Next slide. So as a reminder uh, or an introduction, uh, the Smarter Balance Theory of Action uh, that we developed well over a decade ago now, which is hard to uh, believe, it's pretty basic. And that is the premise that the way uh, we support improvements in teaching and learning is that we help teachers by providing resources that they need. And the Smarter Balance Assessment was then defined um, with uh, three major components, the summative assessment, the inter interim assessment, and then tools for teachers, which supports that uh, formative assessment process that's so essential uh, to uh, changing practice in real time to meet students' real-time needs. Uh, so the premise is uh, that if you have the standards and you provide the resources that are helpful to improve teaching, then students will learn more and they will leave high school uh, with, with choices rather than having the choices defined for them based on a, their opportunities or their background. And so really making uh, available the full array of opportunities that students should have based on providing them high quality learning opportunities. Next slide. So more specifically in terms of this particular slice of what is a much larger issue about improving teaching and learning, uh, we asked three basic questions. Uh, the first that I, I uh, pre touched on is can that um, can we reduce the footprint of the summative assessment at the end of the year uh, by giving more flexibility to administer the performance task uh, earlier in the year 
based on uh, the, the needs of the district or school, the needs of the teacher, the needs of the student, uh, how that might fit better. Uh, the next question was, uh, can we provide resources that help teachers uh, better understand and better address the higher order thinking skills that the performance tests measure with the goal not that students do better on the test, but uh, the goal that uh, teaching is improved and that students have access uh, to these skills and can apply their skills uh, during the year so that they are more successful uh, in, in retaining them and as a consequence of that, demonstrating it. But really the focus was on that learning, that teaching and learning process. And then uh, the essential question is, uh, what supports do educators need uh, to be able to engage in these tasks uh, to improve their uh, teaching of higher order thinking skills and adjust to their students' needs? Next. So uh, as a level setting opportunity, I uh, wanted to describe the Smart Balance Performance Task um, and, and really uh, owe Linda a huge thank you for her uh, continuing support in helping to make available this unique system. Um, it, was a, it was a hard fought change uh, 10 years ago and still is unique in that uh, the Smarter Balance Performance Tasks are designed to provide students with that opportunity to demonstrate their higher order thinking skills and um, it was designed in a way to be consistent with how uh, K-12 educators and higher ed uh, faculty uh, provide instruction and the activities and the demonstration of skills that they expect in authentic settings. So that when we're measuring these knowledge and skills, it's measuring in a fashion that's consistent with the type of application that students need to do in their, um, in their uh, post-secondary uh, objectives. And so uh, we ask students to explore and analyze uh, really real world type settings. So in the context of English language arts, they're asked to review uh, three uh, informational articles that are complex. And then they're asked to write an analytical essay uh, that utilizes evidence from those informational articles to um, either provide a rhetorical or argumentative essay uh, as the case or narrative as, a, as appropriate for the grade. And for mathematics, uh, the performance task is unique is that it asks students to address a real world problem from multiple um, angles. And then not only to uh, analyze uh, the problem, but also communicate their approach to solving the problem. And uh, that's essential uh, in, in business environments, as well as to be successful in more collaborative environments in uh, post-secondary education. And uh, it's, it's a very difficult uh, concept to otherwise measure on a summative assessment. Um, next slide. So as we're thinking about using this performance test, which uh, as, a, as a starting point, uh, for measuring these higher order thinking skills, um, sometimes called 21st century skills, um, sometimes um, uh, pra uh, called practices or, or operations, lots of different labels. Uh, but those are critical thinking skills that uh, we, we value uh, that can be generalized across a variety of topics. Uh, we implemented this study in fall of 2021 and uh, it was difficult to gain participation uh, in part because schools and districts were still recovering from the pandemic. And um, similarly, educator availability was limited during the school day um, in part because substitute teachers weren't available, students needs were much greater, uh, teachers were absent in and of themselves due to illness or other taking care of family members. So um, with that context, it was it just want to under, help folks understand that this was uh, possibly the most difficult time ever to initiate 
uh, a study, especially a study that addressed uh, higher order thinking skills and not just the minimum level of, of content uh, that might otherwise be addressed uh, in, a, in a different study. Uh, we are very appreciative that two California school districts participated uh, with uh, 63 educators. Uh, so in the grand scheme of things, uh, it's a wonderful contribution for these educators, and, and I can't express my gratitude enough. Um, we want to be limited, though, in, in the degree to which we apply the results of this and generalize uh, the results of this study, uh, but it is certainly a good start. Uh, to the conversation. As part of their engagement, uh, educators uh, attended four virtual uh, professional development sessions. And those really were intended to help teachers understand the content standards associated with the critical thinking skills that we value uh, so highly and uh, to uh, support their identification and their uh, in adoption and incorporation of instructional strategies and formative assessment strategies that help students better learn uh, those higher order thinking skills. As part of this, uh, they implemented a resource that we now call the uh, Integrated Deeper Learning Resource that Mal mentioned. Uh, it's currently available in Tools for Teachers as a support for all educators. And uh, that was designed to directly uh, walk teachers through uh, some lessons and activities that help address uh, the higher order thinking skills um, consistent with the teacher's uh, instructional uh, scope and sequence. Uh, and then uh, they uh, administered uh, interim assessment performance tasks. And most critically, the professional learning uh, session addressed the scoring of that task. So applying the smart balance rubric to the student work, uh, level setting on that performance expectation that uh, we uh, collectively agree on, and then uh, identifying those features of the task that are exemplars of both the requisite level of performance that we're seeking, but also the um, the indications that the student isn't performing well so that teachers have a better understanding of the features of the student's response that uh, either are uh, indicative of, of uh, proficiency or indicative of um, not yet proficient. Uh, and then as part of the process, the educators participated in surveys and focus groups uh, wherein they described uh, their experience in the um, demonstration of concept. Next slide. So a little bit more about the performance task design. It's uh, as we think about um, how uh, teachers utilize this resource, it was based on an evidence-centered design approach where we ask what are the types of evidence that students should provide in support of a claim that they are proficient? Uh, it was uh, based on a, on a foundation of universal design and accessibility. And we can talk a little bit more about all the features that are available to students, both as universal tools, but also as designated supports or accommodations. Uh, and as I described, it was vetted well uh, throughout the design process with the educators who would rely on these data uh, to help ensure that they represent the content that they are otherwise uh, asking students to learn. Uh, we did engage in cognitive labs with the students to make sure that the evidence that we think we were collecting or we thought we were collecting is in fact representative of what the student's cognitive process and the application of their knowledge uh, described. And then uh, we piloted the tasks and refined them based on the data. Next slide. Uh, so one of the foundation prin founding principles of Smarter Balance is that we incorporate the, the educators, the people that need to use the system into the design and the development of the system. And so educators uh, help write and review these performance tasks, uh, both in terms of content alignment, as well as uh, trying to minimize any bias and, and be attentive to sensitive topics that might prevent students from being able to engage in the test and demonstrate their knowledge and skills. 
Uh, for ELA, we also engage with ele educators to select the passages that are the founding uh, body of evidence for the student's writing. And in math, because um, ELA tests tend to be pretty consistent in terms of their difficulty, um, but math, we have to have a unique rubric for each performance task. We engage in some small scale trials um, which uh, I think Linda has referred to as smoke testing to make sure that they work out uh, and have a good chance of successfully being field tested. Uh, the final step is field testing. And then we go through the rigorous psychometric evaluation to make sure that uh, these tasks are as free of bias as possible and uh, describe students' knowledge and skills in a consistent way uh, across years. Next slide. So uh, as a grounding, as we think about uh, what are critical thinking skills, I'm not going to go into detail about this, um, but I wanted to make sure that we're aware of some of the different tasks that are necessary to um, describe the full body of knowledge in incorporated into California's content standards, but to differentiate what are otherwise uh, considered um, more foundational skills or, or um, uh, lower level skills, for lack of a better term, as compared to these higher order thinking skills. And we can, uh, for ELA, we use a, a, a taxonomy uh, described by Webb, um, where uh, level one is about recall. Level two incorporates uh, comprehension and um, uh, sort of a synthesis within a text. Level three gets more at analytical and, and synthesis across multiple texts. So next slide. Sorry. Um, and then level four, which is very difficult to uh, measure on a single point in time assessment, uh, is about that uh, more extended engagement in uh, understanding content and applying um, problem solving thinking skills and uh, other uh, related knowledge and skills into uh, an artifact or some other demonstration of learning. Uh, so the performance task uh, gets a little at uh, level four. Um, it's, it's notable that Webb describes that extended time is necessary probably, but not sufficient to describe an extended activity given that you could have uh, extended incorporation of recall as an example, but that wouldn't get at this notion of a, of a long-term engagement in a, in a complex uh, application of skill, uh, but it's principally a level three uh, type activity. We can go to the next slide. Uh, and so um, when we're talking about math, we're incorporating some of the cognitive processes that students engage in as they solve problems, as well as the difficulty of, or the, the type of task that they're, they're using to demonstrate. And so uh, we incorporated a, a combination of a cognitive uh, rigor matrix with a depth of knowledge. And so uh, similar to ELA, but slightly different is that uh, DOK is about following simple procedures, uh, calculating operational uh, use of formula. Uh, DOK2 is about selecting the appropriate procedure amidst, uh, and tools amidst a variety of opportunities to solve a problem. Uh, and level three, uh, is, is designing an approach to solving a problem for a specific research question, uh, as well as uh, using reasoning and planning and support, providing supporting evidence uh, for the choices and the solution. And then uh, level four is that more extended approach to a larger uh, holistic uh, solution to a complex problem. Next slide. So as we think then about how do we prepare students, how do we help teachers actually prepare their students to learn these really important skills and not just focus on the lower level skills of recall or, or operations, but uh, fully address and embrace uh, the application of, of their skills in terms of reasoning and, commu and communication and organization and design, uh, we provided a resource that we call, now call the Integrated Deep Learning Resources. Next slide. 
Uh, and uh, originally uh, we named it the performance task support activity, but uh, I think we got some early feedback from uh, this esteemed body that uh, it looked like we were trying to prepare students for uh, success on the performance task. Uh, and that uh, was uh, not the case. And so uh, to at least uh, address that initial misunderstanding, uh, we renamed it to better clarify that these are resources that are designed to support the instruction process, uh, which we believe would help students perform better on an assessment, but that is not the principal goal. Uh, and it incorporates, as part of the approach, it uh, incorporates an understanding or a description of the content standards, walks teachers through uh, potential student uh, learning goals that the teacher will address, provides uh, uh, scaffolding uh, for the teacher to help support students as they engage in an activity, uh, as well as uh, provide some description of plausible student responses, uh, to specific activities that the, that the educator can provide uh, to elicit students' uh, demonstrations of higher order thinking skills. Next slide. Uh, embedded in the approach to the uh, embedded deeper, deeper learning resources is the utilization of a cognitive uh, a framework called ways of knowing. Uh, and uh, we grounded our approach in research. Uh, and uh, there's a, a paper that we published uh, authored by Paulina uh, Bernacki uh, that uh, kind of consolidates all of the available information about how ways of knowing can be a powerful uh, resource, a powerful approach to help instruction. Uh, and uh, I'm by no means an expert on this, uh, but uh, briefly uh, using ways of knowing during instruction uh, is a means of accessing these more complicated concepts, uh, but in a way that draws on students' backgrounds uh, knowledge and experience to help them uh, make relevant uh, these skills and then apply them in a way that is engaging and meaningful for them uh, so that they can truly learn the skills in, the, in, a, in a manner that's consistent with how they see the world, um, which is, um, it's not about uh, changing the standard, it's about changing the context uh, during instruction so that uh, it's relevant. Uh, and that students can utilize their assets uh, during instruction to be successful. Next slide. Uh, similar grounding is the formative assessment process that we utilize. Uh, there are four components to our process. Uh, we uh, uh, support teachers as they clarify what is going to be learned, uh, what, how they elicit uh, information from students about uh, what they have learned and, and uh, the degree to which they can um, uh, demonstrate their knowledge and skills, uh, support teachers as they interpret that evidence, and then the what next, how do they act on it. Uh, this element of the formative, these elements of the, or attributes of the formative assessment process are uh, incorporated into uh, the deeper learning resource, both to uh, support the teacher in the application of that resource, but also to model uh, how they might apply a similar formative assessment process in other circumstances. Next slide. So the professional learning that uh, educators uh, participated in and a, a huge thank you and acknowledgement of, of NTC's work, uh, new teachers work, uh, new teacher centers work on this a product. Next slide. Uh, the goals were to deepen uh, teachers' understanding of the cognitive process and cognitive demands that uh, students uh, need to uh, uh, engage in in order to uh, provide evidence of their higher order thinking skills uh, and also uh, identify and adopt key instructional practices that they can utilize to help students learn uh, and be proficient and demonstrate those skills. Next slide. Uh, there were four sessions. Um, these are the um, one started with the grounding in the uh, standards. Then it was about helping students apply their knowledge uh, in a, uh, related to those standards in a context 
uh, different than the performance desk, but uh, related to the types of evidence that students would be providing in a performance task. Uh, then engaging in that scoring process where teachers apply the rubric and look at student work and discuss uh, the exemplars of proficiency so that they can better apply that in their own instructional context. And then uh, how to utilize that data to support their instructional plan. Next slide. Uh, as part of the process, there were three steps. Uh, they reviewed uh, a performance task as an exemplar of uh, the demonstrations of skill, the, the elicitations that would be required. Um, teachers engaged in a reflection of uh, what are the types of instruction that need to occur? What are the instructional events that need to occur so that students can actually uh, master these skills? And then uh, how can they apply that in their classroom practice uh, to better support their students? Next slide. Uh, some considerations that uh, teachers uh, incorporated were um, looking at the tasks or the, the, the text and asking, do they request students to engage in tasks, texts that are similarly complex or um, as they consider the, the performance that they're hoping students will have? Um, and then are the types of questions that they ask students to answer, are they in fact evidence-based, are they text-based, or are they uh, drawing on information that isn't necessarily uh, exclusively uh, available from the text? And then do um, their instructional activities, do they get at those higher order thinking skills around synthesis analysis and um, holistic approaches to problems? Next slide. Um, student, uh, teachers were asked uh, as an example to identify the specific skills that students would need in order to reach a proficient level on the rubric or on the um, uh, overall on the test uh, related to higher order thinking skills. And then uh, they engaged in an analysis of their scope and sequence to identify when they might administer um, this embedded deep ear learning resource that starts to get at activities that directly relate to the higher order thinking skills and when they might also administer uh, a summative assessment interim performance tasks uh, to uh, consistently and systematically understand uh, how well students have learned those skills. Next slide. Uh, as an outcome then uh, of the professional learning events, we created uh, in uh, collaboration with new teacher centers, some deeper learning educator modules that are also now available in Tools for Teachers that address uh, these uh, professional learning events that I described earlier. Next slide. Uh, so some results. And with a caveat that this is a very small sample, it was a unique time, hopefully a unique time in our history, um, we did get some really positive feedback. And that is 70% um, uh, of the responses, and it's uh, there were some repeated responses in there, but we can, for the purpose of this conversation, we can say 70% of teachers uh, felt that the instructional resources and performance tasks uh, were useful to inform lesson planning, which is uh, incredibly powerful affirmation of the design of the performance tasks uh, to support instructional planning. And then 77% uh, felt confident that they could use the task, uh, the data from the task to actually inform instructional decisions. So uh, being able to use the task as a signal for instruction, which was always a hope uh, that we had, but now to get that validation that um, it is uh, it is feasible, uh, the design works, that teachers can use these uh, tasks as signals for the type of instructional activities that they need students to engage in, to be successful, to acquire these knowledge and skills, and then that the data then can be useful to actually adjust uh, and fine tune their instruction um, are wonderful affirmations. Next slide. Uh, 
not surprising to us, uh, but uh, continuing uh, affirmation that uh, teachers most value those scoring events where they look at the rubric, they look at student work, they discuss uh, what ex which exemplars are indicative of proficiency and uh, the uh, demonstrations of student work that are indicative of, of gaps or needs needing for improvement. Um, the other sessions were, were highly rated, but um, by far uh, scoring, uh, the sessions regarding scoring were most valuable. Next slide. Uh, some quotes uh, about uh, from the teachers that help give some more flavor, some context to their experience. Uh, the takeaway for the for some teachers was about how they were able to use this information to engage with students uh, around um, the higher order thinking skills and help uh, fine tune their conversations about how students need to change their or what students need to do differently in order to. Um, uh, improve their performance and uh, have teachers consider that as well uh, regarding the tasks that they're asking students to engage in and are they really supporting them uh, sufficiently at the depth that students require. Next slide. Uh, the rubric-based approach uh, and as a part of a planning of instruction is incredibly powerful and an affirmation that uh, uh, at least one teacher is going to shift her focus uh, and better incorporate in informational task text into her instruction so that students can build up their repertoire uh, in that area. Next slide. Uh, some issues, uh, and there are many. Um, this is about continuous improvement, uh, which we've been engaged in over the past decade or so. Um, but the PTSAs are hard to administer in a single class period. There's a lot, a lot uh, that's going into those. And so um, we tried to make it as efficient as possible and fit within a single class period. Um, and we weren't entirely successful, so we'll revisit uh, what does that structure look like so that it can be more easily administered and uh, support teachers better? Uh, and the professional learning, we heard there were some teachers that knew this material and felt like it was uh, redundant with what they already know. And other teachers who are newer teachers uh, really valued the information. So really thinking about differentiation of, of content based on um, the teacher's experience is going to be critical moving forward. Next slide. Uh, the, the notion that teachers are going to be able to incorporate these resources into their instruction requires some significant advanced planning, uh, both at the state level, but also uh, within the LEA and the, and the classroom, depending on the flexibility that teachers have regarding their instructional scope and sequence. But to the extent that things drop down from the sky after they already have their plan laid out uh, is, is, is a, a, a recipe for, for failure. And so thinking about how can these processes be established to allow multiple people at every level of the educational enterprise better understand the process and better plan in advance um, is critical to success. Next slide. Um, teachers express concern about, uh, although this uh, demonstration utilizes interim performance tasks, uh, the the uh, angst, the the attention that we need to be brought into the process uh, to better to do something similar with the summative performance task uh, requires that additional level of planning uh, to make sure that uh, districts support the schools and that uh, there's a uh, consistent understanding of the timing of the both instructional events uh, and the assessment events. Next slide. Uh, so next steps. Uh, we're gonna continue to discuss possible models for uh, adding flexibility into the summative assessment with a focus on these higher order thinking skills. Uh, we're gonna vet 
different models with technical experts and, and of course, incorporate educators because uh, we need to make sure that it, the system works for them and works for their students. And then uh, we'll design another pilot uh, that supports California's priorities uh, and really provides a clear value proposition to districts regarding how this will help uh, their teachers, help their students, uh, so that we can encourage participation and and make um, make really uh, valuable changes. So that is uh, our slide. Thank you. Uh, at this point, it'd be great. Thank you so much. Uh, please put up the public comment slide uh, so that we can receive any public comment. Uh, members of the public who wish to provide comments should do so by calling the telephone number uh, that will be on the slide when it goes up uh, and dialing the access code uh, provided uh, on that slide. There we go. And while we're waiting, I want to ask member Orozco Gonzalez uh, if she has any initial comments before me. Um, we'll take any clarifying questions, go to public comment, and then come back for board discussion. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Yes. Um, well, yeah, I have lots of information. I think I'm most interested in seeing how the new instructional professional uh, resources to support integrated deeper learning will help support classroom teachers to elevate classroom learning. The two sets of resources for educators are now available, and I'd like to see how those um, are incorporated in the classroom. I think the integrated deeper learning resources, the instructional resources to support educators' instruction, um, in the full range of higher order thinking skills is going to be key. I think it's going to be all the supports that are in currently. I found that some of the feedback that was given by teachers would be resonated also by me, which is section, sessions regarding scoring was found most beneficial. I know that when I participated in these sessions, um, just looking at student samples and having that collaborative conversation with my colleagues has been key to seeing how we, um, how we evaluate and we follow the rubric. So I think that that's going to continue to be a, a good benefit for teachers. Also, the differentiation of professional learning that needs to be tailored to um, the different teacher needs. I'm a proficient educator when it comes to assessments. And I know when I sit in my grade level uh, meetings and at the district level and sometimes even at the statewide when we have workshops that invite teachers um, throughout the state, it's always key to have that differentiation because there are multiple levels to where teachers are at. And I think that that will also help um, elevate student learning. And the more I can say for the next steps is yes, incorporate as many educators at different levels to give feedback, to participate in these professional learning opportunities, because the more that we dive in as educators and we're provided with those opportunities, I think that the students will have a better opportunity to succeed in these performance tasks. I'm excited to see the deeper level educator modules. I think that these professional learning resources will definitely um, provide the professional learning community an opportunity to dive in and have the opportunity to, to present it to their um, local agencies to just down to nucleus to the classroom where you have those grade level meetings where teachers plan and collaborate. It's that tailoring that um, that time that they spend um, looking at these assessments that will really uh, meet the needs of our students. So thank you for all the information going forward. Incorporate as many educators as you can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just note that um... Yeah, Smarter Balanced has been on the forefront of trying to really move towards assessment of for and as learning in a variety of ways. So a lot of those were detailed. It's um, exciting to see some, some potential uh, next steps in doing that. Um, Tony mentioned that uh, I was a strong advocate for performance tasks as part of assessment when Smarter Balanced was founded. I was once on the technical advisory board for the assessment. Um, and uh, the 10 or so states that are involved in Smarter Balanced have you know, been those that have really wanted to lift up the 
higher order thinking skills and 21st century skills that we all started talking about in the 1990s, <laughs> but are still trying to get to in our curriculum instruction and assessment system. So uh, the idea for you know, this um, uh, demonstration of concept really began during the pandemic as we were trying to figure out how to make it possible for people to engage in assessment in under the challenging conditions, but there are now a number of states that are looking at ways uh, across subject areas to um, make assessment much more part of the instructional uh, process during the school year, not just at the end of the year. So it will be interesting to see what is plausible and productive and supportive of the teaching and learning process as member Orozco Gonzalez says it's really um, to support educators and students in the learning process that we would undertake uh, any of the um, potential moves that would evolve from this kind of exploration. So thanks to Tony for leading it. Um, I want to let board members, if you have clarifying questions about specifics, uh, get those on the table now, hold the bigger discussion until after we have public comment. Uh, so with that, are there any clarifying questions at this moment before we go to public comment? Yes, member Lewis. Just just one question, um, you know, uh, in the report, because of the range of readiness that the teachers reported during that professional learning, you know, some found the information, you know, regarding the performance tasks, that information kind of difficult and some felt like it was repetitive. Is there any um, timeline yet for the next steps to be able to reach more educators and prepare. Uh, Tony, do you have a response to that? Yes, President Darling Hammond and uh, Member Lewis. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so I, I think some additional context that's really critical to as a foundation is that uh, California is unique in the volume of professional learning events that it provides on a on an annual basis, and uh, there's. I think 12 different workshops and and 24 or and 12 different settings across the state for each workshop. Um, so this demonstration concept is a small slice of what otherwise is a large bar body of professional learning uh, that uh, CDE provides. Um, we're not quite sure how to fine tune yet the professional learning uh, because we don't yet know what the focus will be for the next pilot, uh, but it's more than likely going to incorporate the scoring event um, as, as a principal focus. And then um, we'll, we'll consider what other uh, knowledge and skills, what other uh, adult learning goals we need to address, but certainly giving some opportunities for people to step in later into the session um, if they already have the grounding, uh, but to engage, for instance, if they already know the rubric, they don't need to learn about the rubric, but then to engage in the scoring event where that collaborative uh, review of student work and that uh, that wonderful argument that can occur about uh, those threshold demonstrations of performance, um, they might be able to engage in that successfully and have that be facilitated by an expert. Uh, but we'll continue to consider uh, what can we provide in addition to what California already provides uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Any other clarifying questions at this moment? All right, let's go ahead to public comment and then we can come back and have a more complete discussion. Uh, if anyone wants to call in for public comment, please dial the number uh, shown on the slide and uh, punch in the access code. Uh, comments are limited to one minute. Do we have any public comment? Uh, yes, we do. It looks like we have a couple callers in the queue. I will open the phone line now. Terrific, thank you. Good morning, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute, your time starts now. Uh, Peter Ahern, California Association of Science Educators, speaking on behalf of a coalition of science educators and organizations. We are grateful to CDE for their work on getting CAST to meet the federal requirements. We are excited about the work on the CAST assessment innovations and the interim assessments and look forward to following the progress and supporting the work. We understand from CDE's timeline that science is planned to be on the dashboard in 2024. 
We are disappointed by this timeline since 2023 is the year that we have two years of data, and our understanding has been that science would be on the dashboard once two years of valid and reliable data were available. We ask again that there be at least be a placeholder in this year's dashboard to signal to districts that they need to invest in science education. Many districts have not yet invested in NGSS curriculum and professional learning and are not likely to do so until science is included on the main dashboard. Having a strong science education for all students is vital to provide equitable access to STEM career pathways. It is also critical that California has a science literate workforce and citizenry. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Hello, my name is Melissa Martucci, and I'm a high school science teacher in the Central Valley. My district serves a high number of disadvantaged students. We are very excited to see that the CAST results have a link on the California dashboard for 2022, indicating the importance and relevance of creating a scientifically literate community. However, with the high number of STEM jobs available and low number of Californians from underrepresented student groups prepared for these positions, I feel it is of the utmost importance to place science on the dashboard in a way that highlights and supports the need to increase diversity in STEM fields. To do this, districts need to make science a priority. Districts rely heavily on indicators from the dashboard for guidance on setting priorities. Thus, I urge the State Board of Education to include a performance level for the CAST, the science test, in 2023 so that all districts and principals can make science a priority as they develop or refine their LCAT plans and treat core areas equally, especially in the elementary grades, rather than masking its presence. Thank you for your time and diligence in this matter. Thank you. That concludes public comment for item number three. All right. And it reminds us that the uh, evolution of CAST is also on the agenda um, that we heard about in this informational item. Uh, now we can open up the floor for discussion. Um, and uh, any comments that folks would like to make about the evolution of the system? Uh, we will be looking, by the way, for an opportunity for a, a more in-depth conversation among the board members about uh, where assessments um, should and could go in our, our state. Um, but this is a good introduction to some of what is being thought about in the department. Yes, Member Glover Woods. Thank you. I, I had just a couple of questions. And again, just to reiterate, I believe uh, President Darling Hammond, what you've said and what we've heard throughout the presentation regarding the importance and really the purpose of the assessment, which is to guide instruction for students. And I, I really do believe that the evolution that we are going to see with our assessments and assessment system will help to lead us closer to that goal. I have two questions. One is in regard to the peer review, and the second is in regard to the performance task pilot that just took place. So first for the peer review question, um, I do realize that we received the, I believe, fully meets ranking for the SBAC, ELA, and math blueprints, but that was for the full form, and we are using the adjusted blueprint now can you give us some insight as to if there will be a peer review of the adjusted blueprints? And if so, what the timeline will be for us to know um, if those adjusted blueprints fully meet uh, the peer review as the form, full form does. So that's question number one. <laughs> that sounds like it goes to Mal. So uh, Mal, if you can help us with that. Sure. Uh, is my mic on? No. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, yes, although we uh, are fully meet requ um, meets requirements for our uh, Smarter Balanced Summative Assessments for English and Math are for the full form blueprints. So some uh, the U.S. Department of Ed did indicate that uh, they are aware that we are using the adjusted blueprints and they asked for some additional evidence um, that will be required to support the uh, adjusted blueprint forms. Uh, and uh, as, as Smarter Balance is working on the composite claim scores that we hope to uh, provide uh, sometime this year um, to, as uh, additional evidence that um, the U.S. Department of Ed um, will be receiving 
um, to help us uh, pass this additional step of requiring additional vet uh, evidence to support our adjusted footprints. And Tony, I mean, feel free to add anything too. I think you covered uh, most of it. Just add that the uh, U.S. Department, I think, is currently planning on reviewing evidence in June. Um, Smarter Balance uh, was able to uh, was not able to evaluate the uh, gesture blueprint in spring of 21 uh, because the participation was not uh, consistent enough across uh, all of our members. Uh, but then, uh, and then in spring 22, where we had a full uh, uh, administration, uh, we just finally got all the data from our state. So pretty long shadow uh, between the administration and when states are able to clean the data um, uh, associated with the demographics and it's part of their production process for AYP. Uh, and now we're going to engage in those technical analyses in support of uh, a body of information available in June. Thank you, Tony and Mal, because I know that there is a uh of course, strong support for utilizing the adjusted blueprints and uh, being able to get that feedback uh, when it is appropriate to do so within all of the timelines you guys shared will be very helpful. And my second is actually not even a question, just a comment about the performance task pilot. And first, let me say uh, how encouraging it is that that pilot continued even in the midst of everything that was going on during our response to the pandemic and I'm uh, quite encouraged and excited that there will be an additional pilot that will give some more information under, I would say, a more normal setting that we have um, so that that information can be utilized and even compared to the information we received from the pilot that has just completed uh, with, again, knowing the goal is to really take those performance tasks and allow for them to be a more integral part of instruction during the school year. So again, it meets that goal of helping to drive and support teaching and learning and not just seen as kind of this thing we do at the end of the year um, and then move forward from it. So um, thank you again. And thanks Cheryl, Mal and Tony for such a comprehensive presentation. Thank you, um, member Yashimoto Tauri and then member Escobedo. Thank you, Board President. Um, I also wanted to thank the uh, the educators in the two districts, uh, knowing that there were less than ideal you know, situations at the time, and uh, the department and the consortium, because I think I was thinking about the four young people that were with us this morning, and the fact that all of their dreams depend on higher order thinking skills. Uh, and the fact that, you know, fixing climate change, for example, uh, and the emphasis on facts, speed, accuracy, are necessary, but they're not really sufficient, uh, particularly in this digital age where we can get the recall on our smartphones so quickly. So, um, and I also just wanted to note that the what excited me about the study was that the calibration of the performance task invites the grown-ups right to do the same kind of collaboration and have the same kind of growth opportunities. Um, so we're seeing that at multiple levels uh, in the system when we have that. Um, and then, so thank you for that. Uh, and then secondly, I just had a comment about the, the outreach opportunities. There was a chart in one of the handouts that listed um, all of the outreach opportunities for um, the, the work that's been done on CASP. And I wanted to share just um, perhaps a suggestion that um, in definitely in large districts, but even in small and medium sized districts, uh, the data coordinators are often not the same people that are the heads of instruction, the heads that supervise schools, and also the heads that, that handle communication in the district. And so when I was a member of the Trial Urban District um, group, the TUDA for the NAEP, we had the opportunity to bring the the, the head of instruction, the head of the you know data, the head of communications together to learn this information that you shared today in a very brief setting. Uh, and then they could go back and talk with their data, data representatives. And I thought that that was a really effective way of getting the information out and sort of heightening the opportunity in front of all of us to use some of these uh, incredible tools that you're developing. So I just wanted to recommend that as a, as a next step. Thank you. Terrific, thank you. Uh, member Escobedo and then Member Rodriguez. 
I just appreciate the innovation of California and the efforts of elevating DOK in the system, which is so drastically needed. And I just wanted to ask, um, one, is there any outreach to teacher preparation programs, especially when I reflect on slide 35, where, prep, uh, where teachers felt that preparing students for the performance task and planning for instruction really ranked, you know, lower than, than the other responses that, uh, you know, as we embark in this journey, I hope that we're reaching out to teacher preparation programs to ensure our teachers are well prepared from the beginning and understanding, you know, how to plan and really instruct our students in these type of higher level thinking skills, because it's not just the activity, right? But it's the type of questions you pose as well. And, and it takes collaboration, to, it takes really thoughtful planning. So just, just uh, wondering if there are any plans for that. Um, is that a question you think for Tony? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yes, Tony. All right, Tony, that's coming to you. Thank you, President Darling Hammond and, and Member uh, Escobedo. Um, it's, uh, it's a necessary step. And uh, part of our, uh, we do have a strong relationship with California State University through the EAP program. Uh, and really CSU was a foundational uh, guide for the consortium's assessment design as it, as it uh, considered what does an assessment that measures college readiness uh, in uh, K-12 look like. Uh, and so there's a lot of, of connections uh, via that. Um, incorporating uh, the tools and the resources and the training into uh, teacher prep programs has been a challenge, uh, I would have to say. And there's, there's logistical issues, there's um, uh, human issues and uh, dealing with humans always, it'd be easier to deal with humans if we didn't have to deal with humans, I think. Um, but um, it's, it just gets, it gets complex. So I think uh, uh, having a, a state level goal um, to be able to incorporate some of these resources into higher ed curricula uh, might be a helpful positive force. And if there's uh, a way that we can convene uh, interested parties that can help contribute to that um, that direction. I think that would help move things forward. But it's hard for us to do it at the consortium level um, uh, otherwise. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Member Rodriguez. Yes, thank you. And thank you so much for uh, what I see as a very uplifting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, the seen assessment and deeper learning and higher order thinking all in the same presentation really fills me with uh with joy and hope uh when you know i was i was very fortunate in 2000 when i was uh went through my teacher preparation program and was trained in performance assessments and performance tasks uh deeper learning and then suffered through teaching during No Child Left Behind with, you know, A, B, or C. If you have any doubts, choose C. And I was ready to leave the profession. And um, I was in tears when I ran into President Darling Hammond at a national board um, conference. And I told her, I said, I, I think I'm done. And she said, hang in there. We have some great things coming down. Um, you know, in California, some great changes are, are on the way. And this was, I think, in 2008 uh, when, I, when I ran into her. So I'm happy to see this. This is the, the horizon. Um, and, and performance tasks, I think, um, you know, when, when I think about, like, the uh, national board process uh, at TPAs, right, you know, I think those are great preparations. The because there, it's authentic assessment, which is what, uh, you know, when I, when I uh, assess my students with performance tasks um, or, you know, project tasks, they, it's, I, I get authentic information, right? You know, like with the national board uh, and in, and in um, 
my teacher prep where we would analyze gaps in students thinking based on their the performance assessments and um, so I think creating a practice of that uh, and enforcing it with uh, our own teacher performance assessments is a wonderful step in this direction uh, right and, and taking using assessment to guide deeper learning um, now, I did have a question, and, and I'm not sure if you have information, uh, but you know, with the 70% of teachers felt that the resources and performance tasks were useful, and I understand that the circumstances, um, as member uh, Yoshimoto Tower mentioned, probably weren't the best for some of the teachers because of everything that was happening, but did you have any information on the 30% who didn't? What like maybe what they felt that they needed more of or less of? Tony? Thank you. Uh, I don't know specifically, it would be uh, helpful for us to analyze the data that way. What we did hear though is this, uh, the, the gap between um, when the teachers better understood the activities and uh, the the specific instructional scope and sequence that they had already planned. So uh, because we ended up starting this discussion in fall uh, and the district had already established a systematic date as to when the interim assessment performance tasks were administered, it wasn't that coherence that we were seeking uh, from a teacher's perspective regarding the measure uh, that they were administering and the instruction that they were providing. So uh, I think uh, had the professional learning event around using the instructional tasks as a signal for instruction, had that happened in August or, or um, during the professional learning events uh, prior to the solidification of the instructional plan, we probably would have gotten more positive uh, responses. And that's something that we're trying to consider as we think about what are the requisite uh, elements that need to be in place for this theory of action to, to come into being. Thank you so much. And lastly, um, uh, in regard to the higher order thinking and what uh, member Yoshimoto Tauri uh, talked about, you know, the students that we saw this morning and how those skills are necessary. They're necessary for problem solving. And uh, when I was in teacher prep school, we used to call higher order thinking skills the HOTS. And um, that was our, you know, like wanted to make sure that we had that in there. So you reminded me of that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I think we've heard from everyone who wants to contribute at this point. As I say, this will be an ongoing conversation with members of the board. So uh, this is just a taste of what is to come. I want to thank Tony and Cheryl and Mal for all of their presentations. And uh, this concludes this information item. We can take a little break. Uh, it's 1047, so I will see you back at uh, 1102. <laughs> See you then. Please leave your, uh, uh, stay in the meeting, but just. Right, welcome back. Uh, board members, we need to reestablish re a quorum. So Brooks is going to call the roll. Member Yoshimata Tauri. Present. Member Rodriguez. Present. Member Porter. Present. Member Patillo Brownson. Here. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Here. Member Olkin. Here. Member McQuillan. Here. Member Lewis. Here. Vice President Glover Woods. Here. Member Escobedo. Here. President Darlin Hammond. Here. Most present. All right. Uh, at this point, we're going to take up item number four, which is the approval of the fiscal year 2022-23 career technical education incentive grant allocations, including the allocation formula, the specific funding amounts, and the number of grant awards, the purposes for the grant fund use, and allowable and non-allowable expenditures. 
Um, I do understand that uh, member Yoshimoto Tauri needs to recuse herself from this item. So member Yoshimoto Tauri, uh, please recuse yourself by turning off your camera and microphone for the discussion and the vote. Thank you. We'll let you know when you can come back. Uh, the CDE recommends that we review and approve uh, the formula funding amounts uh, and purposes for which grant funds may be used uh, and the allowable and non-allowable expenditures. There are two attachments that are part of the deliberations. The item will be presented by Pete Callis of the CDE. Pete, please begin. Good morning, President Darlene Hammond, State Board members, and Chief Deputy Nicely. So I'm here to present on the California Technical Education Incentive Grant Program. I'll talk about the program overview and funding. The, I'll do an allocation example, and then we'll request for approval of the allocations. So an overview, the program was established as a state education, economic, and workforce development initiative to provide pupils in kindergarten through grade 12 with knowledge and skills necessary to transition to employment and post-secondary education. The funding began in 2015 as a three-year program. We received $900 million over three years. Uh, the first year was 2015-16. We had $450 million with a one-to-one -one match requirement. 2016-17, we had $300 million with a 1.5-to-1 1 .1 match requirement. And 2017-18, we had $150 million with a two-to-1 match requirement. The funding was extended in 2018-19 uh, through 2021 for $150 million per year at a two to one match. Um, in 2021-22, the funding amount was increased to $300 million of ongoing funds at a two to one match. And this year, 22-23, is $300 million ongoing funding with a two to one match. So an overview of this year, uh, for the funding. CTIG is a formula-based competitive grant program. 70% of the funding is for base calculated over, calculated on the LEA's average daily attendance. 30% of the formula is based on eight positive considerations. Four positive considerations are at 5%, three positive considerations are at 2% each, and one positive consideration is at 4%. There are three funding groups associated with the ADA for each of the LEAs. 4% of the funding or $12 million is designated for applicants with ADA of less than or equal to 140. 8% or $24 million is designated for applicants with ADA of more than 140, but less than or equal to 550. 88% of the funding or $264 million is designated for applicants with ADA of more than 550. 2022-23 CTIG was determined by a formula calculation or the LEA match. So in other words, the allocation for each of the LEAs was the lower of the two. If the LEA had the calcu their calculated allocation was lower than the match, they received the allocation. If their calculated allocation was above their match, they would receive up to their match for their allocation. And that's in statute. So in 2022-23, the CTIG allocations for round 8A, funds available, total funds available were $300 million. We had 383 total applications. Of the 383, 375 applications were approved. The total ask based on the LEA's match for all of the applicants, we had an ask of $398,290,530. Total funds that we allocated, that we have allocated in the round 8A that we're asking for approval today is $265,572,347, which leaves us, we, we are just completing a round 8B for this funding with a total amount available of $34,427,000, $427,000, $6,000, for round 8B. So an example of how we do the calculation for um, an allocation for one LEA, and this is for a fictitious school, Birch Tree High School. Uh, their ADA is 1,000. Their unduplicated pupil count is 900. 
of the positive considerations, they are rural, they have a high dropout rate, a high unemployment rate, and the high collaboration um, across with other um, entities. So their base rate of for, they fall into the uh, upper level category of over 550 ADA. So their base is calculated on nine, $96.64 per ADA times 1,000, which leaves them with their ADA share is $96,640. They are considered rural. Their rural rate is $41.54 per ADA, which gives them a rural share of $41,540. Their next positive consideration is their collaboration share, which is $6.36 per ADA. That gives them $6,360 for their collaboration share. Their unduplicated count is $5.08 per unduplicated. And remember, that calculation is based on 900, not 1,000, which gives their unduplicated share $4,572. The dropout rate, the high dropout rate calculation is $8.74 per ADA which gives them $8,740. And then their high unemployment rate share is based on $17.12. So they would receive $17,120. Their total calculation added up between the base and all their positive considerations is $174,972. Their maximum match was, the two to one match was 220,000. So as you can see, they were, their allocation is based on their total calculation because it's the lower of the two numbers. It's below their match. So our recommendation, CDE recommends approval of the Career Technical Education Incentive Grant Program 2022-23 allocations. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Pete. We're going to... Um, put up the public comment slide. Uh, we'll open the phone line now for the public comment queue. Members of the public wishing to provide comment may do so by calling the telephone number and using the access code shown on this slide. And while we're waiting, I'd like to ask our, is, our liaisons, Member McQuillan and Member Rodriguez, if they have any initial comments. Um, Member McQuillan. Yes, thank you. I want to Say thank you to Peter for all the work on this. And, you know, when I think of CTE in this whole area, you know, I think we're just realizing what this means to us in the state of California and our future workforce, you know, the skills-based positions that CTE represents, you know, from IT and the computers we're on right now for them to function well. And, and when we have problems with them, it's the CTE folks who are going to come and repair them. Or I think of all the, the wave of uh, EV vehicles, electric vehicles, and what are we going to do when they break down? I mean, uh, this area is becoming so important to, to us and um, our futures uh, here in California. I really appreciate uh, the breakdown and you giving the examples of how the allocations are, are, are given out, Pete. Uh, uh, you know, in incorporating areas where there's high unemployment in the rural areas um, getting um, recognized and some points there. Um, there are really some differences in California when you think of the jobs, CTE jobs in rural areas compared to our urban areas. So I appreciate that area very much. So uh, it's a, you presented a very high, uh, um, rate of those who did succeed. I think it was uh, only eight or nine who did not succeed in their applications. I'm wondering if there were any themes there of any of those applications who did not uh, get funded. But anyway, thank you for your work in, in the presentation. And we can come back to that question later on. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Member Rodriguez. Um, also, thank you for the presentation and Member McQuillan covered everything. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, are there any clarifying questions that anyone has before we go to public comment? 
I'm not seeing any of those. So let's see if there's anybody in the public comment queue. Uh, we don't have any callers in the queue. So that concludes public comment for item number four. All right, so we can now open it up for board discussion. Um, and um, Member McQuillan, if you wanna ask that uh, question of um, Mr. Callis, please uh, feel free and any other questions that folks have. Or yes, comments. if I could, uh, just if there were any themes of folks who did not get funded, any themes of those applications that were not successful. Thank you. Yeah, so I can address that. A majority of them, as you said, there were eight or nine. A majority of them just did not complete the application process. And we reached out to them even after the, the closing date to assist them if they wanted to, you know, if something happened, tech, like you were talking about earlier, if technology fails, we're there to assist them. And we followed up with all of the applicants that did not complete their applications to assist them with completion. Some of them chose to uh, not move forward with them. They have a chance in the 8B round to go after it again, right, if they were not successful. Correct. Right. Thank you. Terrific. And, you know, thanks to the staff for doing that, you know, careful follow up. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, um, then uh, we can take a motion. Do I have a motion to approve the allocations? Member Bequillen? Yes. Did I, I see your hand go up? <laughs> I'll make that motion to approve. All right. And I'll second it. Thank you, Member Rodriguez. Is there any other discussion? If not, uh, Brooks will call the roll for the vote. Member Yosho Maratari. Sorry, recused. Member Rodriguez? Yes. Member Porter? Yes. Member Patillo Brownson? Yes. Member Orozco Gonzalez? Yes. Member Olkin? Yes. Member McQuillan? Yes. Member Lewis? Yes. Vice President Glover Woods. Yes. Member Escobedo. Yes. President Darling Hammond. Yes. Motion carries. All right. So uh, at this point, um, we're a little early. We're a little ahead of our schedule. It and we can take a break for lunch, an early lunch. Um, our next item is probably a good hour and a half long item. So we don't. I don't want to get us started on that. And then, you know, we might get hangry before the end of it. So <laughs> uh, those of you who work in high schools are familiar with the staged lunches, you know, just think of yourself as getting the first lunch <laughs> in the three or four that are being offered. Um, and so we will um, stop here and reconnoiter at about 1145. All right, welcome back from that leisurely lunch. Uh, that's a, an indulgence we don't normally get. Uh, board members, we need to reestablish a quorum, so Brooks is going to call the roll. Member Yoshimoto Tauri. Present. Member Rodriguez. Here. Member Porter. Here. Member Patillo Brownson. Here. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Here. Member Olkin. Here. Member McQuillan. Here. Member Lewis. Here. Vice President Glover Woods. Here. Member Escobedo. Here. President Darlene Hammond. Here. No one's present. All right, here we go. Um, item five is the update on the implementation of the integrated local, state, and federal accountability and continuous improvement system. Information item uh, related to the implementation and use of school climate surveys to improve outcomes as required in the State Board of Education adopted local indicator self-reflection tool for priority six, which is school climate. Uh, this is an information item. No action is recommended at this time. The item will be presented by William McGee of the uh, Department of Education, Rebecca Cerna and Tom Hansen of West Ed, and Nicole DeWitt and Sharon Ru Rubalcava of San Diego Unified. Uh, William, great to see you. Please begin. Great. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. 
fellow President Darling Hammond, Vice President Glover Woods, State Board of Education members, Superintendent, Chief Deputy Officer, staff and community. My name is William McGee. I'm the Division Director of the Student Achievement and Support Division. And we are happy to be here today to discuss our item. So just a little bit of an overview for you all. We appreciate the opportunity to explore Priority 6 self-reflection tool and to be able to provide background on the tool and an overview. The Center for School Climate at West Ed will talk about their work and supporting California's LEAs, as well as introducing LEA to talk about their practices and utilizing the tool. This was great because it provided an opportunity at continued collabor collaboration. My team, Unity Sakamoto and Ray Dean Girola, collaborated with the whole child division, Tom Herman and Hilva Chan, and this was an opportunity for me as a new member of CDE to meet the West Ed team and San Diego Unified School District. So we're excited that the board is engaged in this conversation today. So I'll read this slide just to ground us in the work of local indicator performance standards. For the local indicators, the State Board of Education adopted performance standards that require an LEA to annually measure its progress in meeting the requirements of the specific LCFF priority, report the results as a part of a non-consent item at the same public meeting of local governing board body at which the LCAP is adopted, and report results to the public through the dashboard utilizing the State Board of Education adopted self-reflection tools for each local indicator. An LEA uses the State Board of Education adopted self-reflection tools to report its progress through the dashboard. The collection and reflection on locally available information relevant to progress regarding local priority areas is intended to support LEAs in completing the self-reflection tools, reporting in the dashboard, and in local planning and improvement efforts. A little bit about the self-reflection tool history for Priority 6. In 2016, the board adopted Priority 6 reflection tool and then in response to improvement in the tool in 2017, the CDE convened the School Conditions and Climate Work Group, which then looked at the tool, made some recommendations, and the State Board then revised Priority 6. And so basically the revisions with the recommendations are what we are using now for the Priority 6 self-reflection tool. In this presentation, we'll touch on all of the various components of the LCAT template and instructions. LEAs are to provide a narrative summary of the local administration and analysis of a local climate survey. The survey is to be conducted at a minimum every other year. A narrative of the survey should be input on the California School Dashboard, which then is made public. LEAs will have an opportunity to include differences among student groups from the survey. For surveys that provide an overall score, the LEA can report the overall score for all students and student groups. The LEA may also include an analysis of a subset of specific items and additional data collection tools that are relevant to the school conditions and the climate to really help them narrow down what they're working with. Here is the Priority 6 School Climate Self-Reflection Tool. So again, it's all about data, meaning, and use. When reporting on the dashboard, an LEA shall include these components. Data, reflect on the results and share what the LEA learned. Meaning, making sense of the data, breaking it down by grade level, student group, what does the data show as strengths and or growth areas for the LEA? And finally, use, making the data actionable. How will the LEA utilize the data to make changes and or strengthen and continue practices that are effective? While a comprehensive analysis was not done, a review of three counties with a total of 258 LEAs 
show very few LEAs disaggregated data via student groups. At the local levels, LEAs disaggregate the data for their local review context for grade span, topics, and other items. Not many LEAs disaggregated their data based on specific student groups. CDE, in partnership with West Ed, hosted a webinar on December 5th, digging deeper into school climate to inform your LCAP. There were over 380 participants who joined the webinar to learn various topics, such as how LEAs can explore school climate data to be included in LCAPs, ways to dig deeper and understand school climate data, Anaheim Union High School District's approach with engaging educational partners in this process was highlighted. What West Ed does is they provide different levels of support to California's LEAs. They hosted a series of webinars through, from January through June where over 200 LEAs participated. West Ed also created a trauma-informed module used for California Healthy Kids Survey, which was completed and in use now. The investment in the school climate at West Ed led to the establishment of the California Center for School Climate in January 2022, which will provide school climate and data use trainings and support LEAs through June 30th, 2024. And now I would like to turn it over to Rebecca Serna and Tom Hansen from the California Center for School Climate. Thank you, Will. As I adjust this, okay. All right, so again, um, my name is Rebecca Serna from West Ed, and I'm here representing the California Center for School Climate, and at the same time acknowledging um, the team that works alongside me in these efforts. Um, I'm here to provide a context about California Center for School Climate, CCSC, and about the importance of uh, school climate. So, at the center, we have four goals that we work towards. We work towards providing a relevant um, and responsive school climate uh, coaching supports to LEAs and to districts, and also um, to support LEAs with data use in terms of best practices for using, for collecting, for using, and for monitoring school climate data. Uh, we also serve as a connector across the state for LEAs and also help them in supporting the dissemination of best practices already in existence. Um, we also support LEAs in, in strengthening the, those relationships that they have with their educational partners. So our center launched in January, or the center launched in January of last year. So it has, and we have funding through June of 2024. And through the CCSC, we provide various um, supports. For example, um, we provide school climate data use virtual sessions, like what Will mentioned that we provided, um, that we collaborated on with Anaheim uh, Union High School District. We also have had a session where we collaborated with Butte County Office of Ed and, um, and Paradise Unified School District where they highlighted how they used their school climate data in an effort um, to support post-disaster mobilization efforts after the fire that they experienced in their community. Um, we also offer peer learning exchanges where our smaller opportunities for districts to come together and have conversations around topics of discussion related to school climate, topics that are selected based on inquiry surveys that um, they complete we have collaborated with agencies in hosting these peer learning exchanges, such as Children Now, and also school districts like Davis Joint Unified School District. We offer um, school climate professional learning supports. Uh, we host an annual virtual event. Our next one is scheduled for February 28th, and our registration for that event will be live on Monday, where we will be highlighting um, sessions on community schools, on culturally responsive pedagogy, on 
um, how relationships are critical for data use practices. We have a panel for that session as well, and we're culminating the event with our um, youth advisory team. And we also develop resources for the field, such as briefs and toolkits. We co-developed a toolkit with our youth advisory team, a group of uh, high school students from across California, where they developed activities on how to cultivate caring relationships among staff and students. And we have an audio gallery that hosts audio casts highlighting some best practices across the field. For example, um, we have one that we worked on with Shasta County Office of Education where um, they highlighted how they co-design culturally responsive practices with their tribal partners. Or one that we um, collaborated with Pajaro Valley Unified School District on a community-based approach of, towards student and family uh, well-being. So those are some of the, those things that we do in an effort to support a positive uh, school climate. So when we're talking about school climate, we really frame it under the definition of the National Center for School Climate, which it, um, it's focused on the conditions and the quality of a school environment that affects the attitudes, the behaviors, the performance of students and staff. So it's about the relationships, the trusting relationships, about the goals and the norms that exist, about the teaching and learning that happens in the school, and about those organizational structures and policies that are there. And it's all framed under three domains. Um, so our three domains are also adapted from the National Center for Safe and Supportive Learning Environments and from CDE's previous work through California Safe and Supportive Schools work. So we frame it under belonging and connections, under safety and wellness, and environment. And under the, those three domains, there are subdomains that exist. So for example, under belonging and connections, it's about the relationships and how that's foundational. And that has a um, turgle effect on engaging educational partners and on school engagement and student agency. And when we think about safety and wellness, we're thinking about the safety of individuals, not just physical safety, but emotional and psychological safety. And um, we have mental health and wellness supports under safety and wellness. And then under environment, we're really thinking about the physical environment, behavioral supports, instructional environment, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. So this framing has really helped support districts in really thinking about what are those indicators that I need to be exploring in order to continuously monitor um, school climate um, data. So all of these efforts um, come together you know, to support meaningful learning because we know that meaningful learning happens when all members of the school community feel safe emotionally, mentally, psychologically, and physically valued, cared for, respected, and are engaged. And the research is growing around school climate, and there's more and more research, and it's all very similar. When students report that they feel that they attend schools with a positive school climate, they report higher levels of school motivation and connectedness. There's higher levels of attendance. There's, um, they score higher on measures of academic performance. They're more willing um, to report a possible threats, safety threats, um, and they're more positive towards their learning. And it's not just about the positive impacts on the students, it's also about the positive impacts to of the adults in the building. So when educators perceive that they work in schools with a positive school climate, it's, um, they have higher levels of job satisfaction, there's less burnout, they leave the profession less they're more invested in the learning of the students. And we think about that and then we go deeper. So these are like research studies, but then we go deeper and we take a look at the data in our, in our state. Um, and fortunately in California, we have access to uh, great sources of school climate surveys, one of them being the California Healthy Kids Survey. And, um, and this really highlights where, why this is also important for California when we have 33% of our seventh graders reporting that they're experiencing chronic sadness and hopelessness, when 28% of them are reporting social emotional distress, or when we look at our high school students that they report, 63% report feeling safe and very safe at school, that means that 37 are not. And when 59% report feeling that they're connected to school, 40% are not being connected to school. So that really, 
um, highlights why this is in critical and important um, uh, to our students and to the adults who work in um, at, at our schools. So we have, it's you know what's also important. You know we have survey data, but what's also important is to also ask the students. So I mentioned that we have a youth advisory team um, as part of CCSC, and we have six students that are representing um, the youth advisory team, and three of them made this um, video to highlight what school climate means to them and why it's important. So, okay, here. Hello and welcome. My name is Amaya Farias, 11th grader at Casa Robo Fundamental High School in San Juan Unified School District. And my name is Julian Brickler-Sklar, 12th grader at Saratoga High School in the Los Gatos Saratoga Joint Union High School District. My name is Alexa Southall, 10th grader at Eastlake High School in Sweetwater Union High School District. We are all members of the California Center for School Climate's Youth Advisory Team, a team of six members representing several regions across California. In our work with CCSC, we provide input as well as help to create resources for schools and districts. This past spring, we contributed activities to a resource called Cultivating Caring Relationships Toolkit which contains activities that help to strengthen staff-student relationships. We're here today to share our perspective about the importance of school climate. A positive school climate is important to me because in order for youth to feel welcomed and comfortable, students need to feel accepted for their different cultures, backgrounds, identities, or ideas. An environment that allows for people to be themselves without the worry of bullying, harassment, or judgment really creates a more secure and independent person ready for life after school. These strong relationships and strong support groups that come with this positive climate can be really helpful for a young person's mental health and overall experience when it comes to social, academic, or personal lives. A positive school climate to me is an environment that works to comfortably increase genuine relationships between peers on campus so that teachers and students are structured and supported when learning, succeeding, and struggling. To add on to what Amaya said, a positive school climate to me is a place where students are encouraged to embrace their individuality. It allows students to have peers and staff to go to if they ever need help. By supporting students both academically and non-academically, it sets students up for long-term success. Thank you all for being here today and working toward making schools a positive place for all to be. As members of the youth advisory team, we look forward to continuing to contribute to the work of this California Center for School Climate. So when we look at data, it's important to reach out you know, to students and to continue to explore. So now I'm gonna pass it to Tom Hansen, who's gonna share. Oh, I'm just trying to move it forward. Hello. And On measuring school climate. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, thank you, Youth Advisory Team. Uh, and thank you, President Darling Hammond and the California State Board of Education. Um, what I plan to present here is a brief description of the state of the state regarding the measurement of school climate uh, with standardized, psychometrically validated uh, student surveys. Um, first. There we go. <laughs> okay, so uh, first, uh, just to keep these top of mind, uh, let's just review the LCFF uh, Priority 6 School Climate Indicators. Um, the um, state indicator is the suspension rate. It's the percent of students who were suspended for one full day during the school year. We, we, um, we, uh, the indicators both for some sort of current, current rates and then changes over time. Um, the local indicator is assessed um, by local uh, climate surveys mm -hmm. that capture valid measures of uh, student perceptions of school student safety and student perceptions of school uh, connectedness. The requirement is that the school climate survey be administered at least uh, every other year, um, and I believe that the annual that there's an annual reporting requirement. 
Okay, so the most commonly used school climate surveys in California are the California Healthy Kids Survey, Panorama Education's uh, Student Survey, and the uh, Youth Truth uh, uh, Student Survey. Um, the California Healthy Kids Survey and Youth Truth, those, those surveys are administered anonymously to students. Uh, Panorama Education Survey is uh, administered um, so that um, respondents can be tracked over time. Um, there are others as well. Uh, there's the Core SEL School Culture Survey. That's administered by uh, approximately 22 districts in the state. Um, it, it includes a lot of the large districts in the state. Note that the core surveys administered it by districts that administer the core oftentimes also administer the CHKS and other surveys here. Um, there's also the PBIS school climate survey that's administered by about 15 districts in the state. And plus there are many um, other sort of locally created surveys, some with support from uh, 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 other organizations like uh, Hanover Research or Gallup, and some just independently um, with, uh, with, you know, by the school districts themselves. Okay, so this table shows that between 2021 and 2122, those two academic years, um, the California Healthy Kids Survey was administered in 695 districts. Um, uh, 299 of those districts administered the survey annually. So that 695 districts, that represents about 66, 67% of the um, school districts in the state. Panorama Education was administered in 202 districts. Uh, uh, pretty much all of the Panorama uh, Education uh, surveys are administered annually. And then the Youth Truth was administered in 80, uh, 80 districts. So if you add those numbers up, you come to a figure around in the high 900s, like 977. Um, and that, that sort of, that number is, um, that's a lot of the districts in the state. Um, and so the, that, <laughs> the reason that number is so high is because many districts administer multiple uh, surveys during that time. The main story here is that the vast majority of districts um, administer, uh, oh, okay. The main story here, again, is the vast majority of districts in the state administer standardized school climate student surveys. This next slide shows the uh, areas or dimensions of school climate assessed by these surveys. Um, CHKS, uh, California Healthy Kids Survey, Panorama, and Youth Truth all measure perceptions of school connectedness and belonging and school safety, although they measure it differently. And all measure other important dimensions of school climate, caring staff-student relationships, high expectations, school engagement, um, I just want to point out some of the strengths of the three main surveys. Um, first, uh, multi-item measures of the, uh, school connectedness and safety are available. Um, multi-item measures are better to cover broad topics like school connectedness and school belonging. Um, just like um, we would not want to rely on a single test item to measure reading comprehension, we would not want to rely on a single questionnaire item to measure school belonging or some such concept. Multi-item measures also reduce measurement error and improve the precision of the measure, making the measures more appropriate for, for examining trends over time uh, for continuous improvement purposes. The other important uh, strength is that the measures assessed on these standardized surveys have been psychometri psychometrically validated. So statistical analysis have been conducted to provide evidence that the measures measure what they are intended to measure and that they are reliable. They basically meet established standards of reliability and validity. 
Um, uh, as you saw above, uh, the survey measures also measure other important aspects of school climate, student voice, meaningful participation, perceptions of the physical environment, peer relationships. Um, all three of the surveys assess um, mental and behavioral health indicators. The CHKS assesses chronic sadness, emotional distress, suicide contemplation, and other more positive aspects of, of health like optimism. Um, the, CS, the CHKS, with the CHKS, CDE has implemented uh, a system that sort of identifies um, districts or schools that have abnormally high suicide contemplation uh, scores. Um, so as data are um, processed, um, WestEd runs some codes, identifies sort of uh, schools and districts where um, the suicide ideation rates are, are far above the average. And then uh, uh, we notify CDE about these rates. And then CDE notifies the school district and, and or the school and provides uh, informational resources to address these high rates of, uh, of suicide ideation. Another strength uh, is that all three surveys are customizable and all three have parallel school staff and family surveys. So this allows for triangulation of the data for student, staff, and parent reports. And finally, um, all three platforms provide data via accessible dashboards to disaggregate uh, data for student groups and monitor trends for all students and uh, for student groups to aid continuous improvement efforts. Okay, this, this next slide, we, we, uh, we'll, um, we've already presented this, so we'll present this earlier, um, but it very loosely uh, describes suggested reporting requirements for the local indicator. As Will described, the self-reflection tool emphasizes reporting with respect to data, meaning, and use of results. With respect to data and meaning, LEAs are asked to report and reflect on scores for all students and disaggregated results for student groups. With respect to use, uh, LEAs are asked to report on actions that will be implemented in response to the results and the extent to which results reflect the impacts of previously implemented actions. So this next set of slides just provides an example of how the CHKS data dashboard provides data in a form that can be helpful for continuous improvement efforts and can be used to disaggregate data for student groups. Um, one simply se selects um, sort of the entity, sort of the domain, and a measure. In this case, uh, perceived safety at school and uh, pardon the resolution of this graphic, but this, this graphic shows the trends in perceived school safety over an eight year period for a school district. Um, you can also identify, disaggregate data by um, 15 characteristics. Um, this includes sort of a proxy for English language proficiency, gender, gender identity, living situation, uh, which includes uh, being, the living situation includes being unhoused, students' reports of being unhoused or living with a foster family. Um, there's parental education and race ethnicity. So let's see the results for race ethnicity. Um, here we see that white and Asian students report substantially higher rate levels of safety at school than African Americans, Latinx, and multi-ethnic students. So one can also use um, these data to look at trends by student group to determine whether disparities are shrinking or growing across time. And again, all three surveys, the main surveys, they have this capacity. Okay, I'm gonna pass it back to Rebecca uh, and she's gonna um, talk about data use in action. Thank you, Tom. So 
what does this look like in the field? The you know schools you know administer these surveys and they use them for their requirements. Um, and also, th these measures allow, um, these indicators allow educators and their educational partners um, with the data needed to really think about what are their strengths, what are the things that they should be celebrating that they're doing well, and what are those opportunities for growth, the needs that they have. It also helps to support, um, to identify what goals, um, how to monitor progress. So as we engage in the work of creating positive school climates, that local context is so important, it's so critical to be able to look by the different characteristics that are available um, by, the dis by the survey that you, they might be using and to prioritize what they should be focusing on. Um, but you know, effective use of the data is not just about having access to the data, it's also about engaging your educational partners in these conversations. And so that is part of like what we are doing at, through the California Center for School Climate. We're working towards trying to build that capacity around data use, specifically around school climate data use. And Will mentioned earlier how we host a series of, of webinars um, around school climate data use practices. Uh, in last spring, between like January and June, we hosted a series of webinars attended by 600 participants representing 201 LEAs in California. Uh, another example of another one that we hosted was one on street data and centering um, student-centered approaches to school transformation, and we collaborated with the street data authors and with the National Center for Social Emotional Learning and School Safety to host that session. We also have, um, as part of CCSC, a school climate data use community of practice where we're working with um, nine um, school districts in providing supports around data use. And what we do is we facilitate um, a data use workshop where we work with their teams, with all of their educational partners in doing a data discovery and data mapping and really goal setting so that it can inform their SIPSA plan so that it can inform their LCAP plans. We also host virtual community practice sessions where we bring together the, we're bringing together all of the participating LEAs and on topics that have been identified by these specific LEAs that are part of this community of practice. And we provide individual coaching supports to these districts in order to offer them that differentiated support that they might need because some of these nine districts, some are very rural and small, and then uh, we have a really, a really large school district that's part of this group as well. Uh, so one example of a district is a Center Joint Unified School District. Um, not too far from here, we facilitated their um, data use workshop where they brought together school staff, administrators, both at the district level and at the school level. They had counselors, they had parents, they had fifth grade students, and we engaged all of their seven schools in conversations around data. And, um, and they've also identified some areas of focus that they wanna work on. They're trying to work on disaggregating their local school climate uh, survey data. In this case, it's Panorama survey that they're using um, in engaging their educational partners in data conversations, including students, family members, and staff. And, um, and to disseminate, what are some best practice approaches to disseminate their local school climate survey results? Um, and as part of this work, we have, um, some county offices of ed have also reached out to us in terms of trying to, uh, you know, that they're also interested in um, having, building that capacity around data use. And in March, we're gonna be launching a peer network for county offices of ed as part of um, the center as well. So now I am going to um, pass it to San Diego Unified. Um, there is many examples of other districts you know, doing a lot of work and San Diego Unified has been well on their journey um, exploring their school climate data use. And so we have with us today, Nicole DeWitt, the Executive Director of Student Services at San Diego Unified and Sharon Rualcava, Program Manager of Counseling and Guidance at San Diego Unified. So I'm gonna pass it to Nicole. Thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to share the work that we're doing in San Diego Unified. Our district's use of school culture and climate data is really reflected prominently in goal one of our local control accountability plan, 
Goal one for our district focuses on cultivating inclusive, anti-racist, and restorative communities. Here you can see our cycle of continuous improvement for our LCAP, a process that starts with an annual board workshop in June of each year with progress monitoring and feedback gathered throughout the months of September through May. Specifically in goal one are actions we take as a district. On this slide, you can see those actions highlighted, which include providing restorative schools and classroom communities, implementation of site equity teams, access to wellness services, structures for responding to students' mental health needs, and elevating student voice. In order to measure progress for those action items, we utilize the Cal Schools survey with an emphasis on the safety, caring relationships, high expectations, and meaningful participation strands. In addition to the Cal Schools data, we also use a variety of internal metrics that include monthly data tracking for the number of counselor contacts, mental health referrals, and suicide risk assessments, as well as real-time data dashboards that sync to our student information system and disaggregate data related to suspension rates, expulsions, and chronic absenteeism. During our last progress monitoring cycle, we highlighted the following from the California Healthy Kids Survey for our educational partners to help us determine what action steps we may need to revise our ad. On this slide, you can see trends for our elementary schools over the past five years that show a need for growth in the areas of caring relationships and social emotional learning. For our middle school students, we see similar areas of need related to school connectedness and caring adult relationships. We also paid close attention to the five-year trends related to students experiencing chronic sadness and hopelessness. Although the data shows a change rate of plus or minus four, the overall number still highlights a significant amount of students, approximately one-third, reporting that they have experienced these feelings. For high school, we performed above the state average in the strands of school connectedness and caring adult relationships. However, we did see decreases in both areas since the beginning of the pandemic. We also again focused on the percentage of students experiencing chronic sadness and hopelessness, which had a net change of zero, but was higher than our middle school rates. Examining our Cal Schools data along with the other metrics outlined led us to revise action steps during our last LCAP board workshop. During that workshop, we highlighted the need to provide a continuum of social, emotional, and mental health services that included ongoing counselor training, mental health services, and education lessons for our high schools, the expansion of our social emotional learning programs at elementary and middle levels, and community partners to assist in assessing the mental health and social emotional needs of our high schools. In addition, we also plan to implement proactive measures in an effort to increase school connectedness and caring relationships through the establishment of family services assistance assigned to each neighborhood who focus on decreasing chronic absenteeism by removing barriers to needed services. I would now like to invite my colleague, Sharon Rublakava, our program manager for counseling and guidance, to speak about the ways school sites have incorporated the Cal Schools data into site-specific goals. Thank you, Nicole. I get to share the fun stuff. So what we're gonna be sharing in the next few slides is an overview of how we're using the um, Healthy Kids data, or actually the Cal Schools data, within the school plans for student achievement overall but also I'm gonna dive into how counselors, being the program manager of counseling guidance, kind of have to share the counseling, how, how counselors really drive their, their programs. So close to 80% of our schools are formulating goals from the data that is received from the Cal Schools data. So that out of the 80%, we have 272 goals and beyond looking at it more, we have 63% of the goals really are dealing with the parent and guardian data that we receive. And the goals are more involving the involvement, the parent involvement, the input in decision-making perception from our participation, excuse me, from all parent and guardian groups. 37% of the goals are using the, the data from students and mainly the caring relationships, meaningful participation and safety. 
So what does that mean? Okay, with the schools, we're gonna highlight at each level. The first level that we are gonna be highlighting is the elementary school level. Robin Erickson is a school counselor and she started at Spreckles in 2019. And trying to formulate the comprehensive school counseling program at Spreckles, she was reviewing the data. And the data that she was reviewing was the chicks data that we have. And she noticed that there was a, there was a need for student connectedness and meaningful participation. So from this, what she's been able to do is to add programs that what make kids want to get to school. So for instance, No Place for Hate, they're in their third year of No Place for Hate. The one that, um, and the kids just, she's, she's a model school for the No Place for Hate program through the Anti-Defamation League. The art enrichment through volunteers for all students. The, what she was able to do is build a community relationship with a program and have volunteers, art teachers come and teach all students. So from these, just, those are just two examples of many programs that she started. She has seen growth as well as gains and students want to come to school. So she, this is something she reflects on yearly, but um, you know, using the California school data, she's been able to see progress or improvement. Lewis Middle School, this is an example of what Tom was speaking of earlier. What Dina Weiss, the head counselor there, what she is able to do is she does staff meetings and she takes the information from the student data, the staff data, as well as the parent guardian data. And then she just lays it out on the table and says, how is everybody's perception? And she does this yearly with staff and she doesn't just do the current data, she references last year, this year, and she has been able to kind of build programs with, at Lewis Middle School with this data as well. The two programs, the, the two problems that she was seeing at Lewis Middle School, and, and by pro problems, they weren't huge problems, but something that needed to be addressed, was the caring relationships that um, middle school students found, as well as safety. So from this, what she was able to do was restructure the placement of staff during lunch as well as during passing periods in order to have the staff be more visible. And the students felt more safe. They also felt that they had could say hi and it wasn't just within a classroom. So with, with just making that little pivot, she was able to have improvement on her scores. The classroom lessons is an ongoing thing that they're doing at Lewis and <clears throat> they work with another a group within San Diego Unified to do bystander conversation and not just let slurs happen. So this is something, once again, that is looked upon yearly and finding improvement. Okay, the high school. So high school, Crawford, Jaime Chavez there. What Jaime did was, was looking at the data and just by first glance, you would not think that Crawford would have a problem because the, what the data with, that he was referencing was the alcohol use, drug use, as well as vaping. And there weren't a lot of students that were participating in daily activity or even trying this. But what he figured out was, even though students were participating, they didn't think it was harmful. So, and that was like red flag. So what he was able to do is he was able to utilize an outside agency, community agency to come in and to do education and workshops. And, and he was able to deliver this and has been able to deliver this in the freshman PE class as well as ROT, ROTC, so, which is a scary thought that the kids may not participate, but they don't see anything wrong if they were offered. So once again, Jaime did an amazing job and continues to do such at Crawford High School. The last example that I'm gonna um, deal with is Morse High School. Morse High School, we actually have an intervention counselor there, and what an intervention counselor does not typically have a normal caseload, but is able to really impacts students on a deeper level, hence interventions. And so what, what she was able to do at Morse High School was take the chick's data, but then formulate her own needs assessment. And from the needs assessment, she was able to get students the help that they need. The two I think that are most prominent here is the food insecurity. Healthy Kids data doesn't give the food insecurity, but what she was able to do was to formulate the questions from the safety questions that she had on, on the chick's data and then pinpoint that there were kids actually that were going home with no food. So she was able to align the community resources to those students 
And not only just do that one time thing, she checks in with them to make sure that the food insecurity is not an issue. Another problem that she was seeing on her campus was that the students didn't have friends. And these are students that wanted to have friends. And so what she was able to do is peers or have students paired up with a peer mentoring program. And from this, they do check-ins, the students feel like they have a voice and they are feeling more connected to the school site. So, and with that, that is San Diego Unified Story. I would like to pass it back to Will, I think. Great, thank you for that informative presentation. I just wanna say thank you to Nicole and Sharon, as well as Tom Herman and Tom Hansen and Hilva, Rebecca Unity and Ray Dean for all their work with this. And so now we will turn it over to public comment. Thank you so much to all of the presenters. Um, that was really uh, informative. Uh, while we're um, opening up the phone line for public comment, those who would like to comment uh, can uh, do so by calling the telephone number and using the access code provided on the slide that is shown now. And then I wanna ask our liaison, Vice President Glover Woods, if she has any initial comments before I add my own. Vice President Glover Woods. Yes, and uh, thank you to everyone who gave the presentation. Definitely appreciate the time that went into bringing forward the data as well as the real life experiences in San Diego Unified. Um, I think I'll frame my brief comments and I may have others once we come back for board discussion, but I think I'll frame my comments with a statement that one of the students said um, on the video that we saw. And um, one of the students said, that school needs to be a positive place for all to be. And I really feel that that statement says it all. Our school climate data really serves almost as a foundation for all of the other data because how students experience school very often shows up in many other aspects that we look at as far as data is concerned on the dashboard and beyond. So as we think about it, uh, I just want to, uh, and as I said, I'll probably come back with a, a more in-depth comment regarding this, but I, I want to really kind of bring our thoughts and minds to the disaggregation of the school climate data. Uh, we know that it is a may do for our um, LEAs. It's not something that they must do. And as was shared at the beginning of the presentation, um, the large majority of LEAs are not disaggregating their school climate data by student group. Um, and the concern in regards to that is as actions are planned and implemented, those actions might miss the mark if that disaggregated student group information is not uh, front and center to really show again the experiences of all. We want the student voice and sometimes the most pervasive student voice we will get is from this survey data. So um, President Darling Hammond, I think I'll kind of just kind of end my comment there. Um, again, I reserve the right to come back and say more. I'm very passionate about this and very passionate about all voices being heard. But um, as I said, I think I will just put a period at the end of that right now until we come back for more conversation. That sounds great. Um, thank you for getting us going and I'll just add how important this is. I wanna second the remarks that Vice President Glover Woods has made. Um, you know, clearly if school is in a place that people feel safe and uh, uh, a caring environment, it's not a place you're gonna wanna be in as we're uh, looking at chronic absenteeism rates that have uh, gone up and the anxiety that students, you know, have experienced during this endemic that we're in now and for lots of other reasons, it's very, very important that we um, really get the most out of the ability to use these kinds of data to make um, changes in the ways that schools operate where that is important to do. Uh, the, um, there was a 
national survey that is done uh, periodically uh, not too long ago that found that fewer than 30% of secondary school students in the country felt that they were in a caring and um, supportive environment. So there's a lot of work to do to, to create those kinds of environments. And we know from the science of learning and development that in fact, uh, social and emotional and academic development are like completely linked, that uh, we learn much more effectively when we feel a sense of trust and belonging, uh, when we're not being stigmatized, when we're not experiencing trauma, uh, and to build a climate in which all of that is taking place, it just takes a lot of explicit effort in schools to, you know, to create the kind of community and supports. Uh, and these data can be very, very helpful as Vice President Glover Wood said, the uh, disaggregation of the data is also incredibly informative uh, and useful in that process. So it's very helpful to be brought up to speed on where we are in the state around this. And I look forward to, to the public comment, to the discussion and to uh, seeing what else we want to uh, be thinking about as we uh, really help schools create the kind of environments that will bring students in, keep them there, and enable them to learn most optimally. Uh, with that, I think we want to open, uh, unless there are any clarifying questions, let me just see, is there any uh, specific clarifying question that anyone has that they want to ask of the presenters? And, if, and after that, we'll go to public comment, and then we'll come back to discussion. So let's go to public comment at this point. Do we have anybody queued up for public comment? Uh, yes, we do. It looks like we have nine people in the queue. I will open the phone line now. Great. Terrific. Good afternoon. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Hi, my name is Amanda Dickey. I'm the Executive Director of Government Relations for the Santa Clara County Office of Education. And I really appreciate the, the great conversation today around um, the use of climate surveys and, and collecting this data on an ongoing basis. It, particularly, I want to mention how helpful having this data has been in implementing the Student uh, Behavioral Health Incentive Program, which is part of the CYBHI or the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Incentive Program. Um, you know, that, that data from our districts and the fact that they regularly participated in collecting data from students really actually helps us get so many steps ahead, many other counties in implementing these types of programs and these investments because we have been looking at that data for a long time and it was really telling us you know, how severe the mental health needs of students were and, and really helped us identify the kinds of services and kinds of spaces that they needed. And we, we used that information both to complete the needs assessment that was required through SBHIP, the Student Behavioral Health Incentive Program, but also really to inform you know, how we decided to allocate funds and prioritize um, um, spending so that we were, you know, our, our plan is to, we have launched student wellness centers on 12 campuses, opening another seven this year, and we'll continue, you know, to, to be looking at the student climate Thank data you, and information as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Hi, my name is Lily Rosenberger. I'm a management analyst at the Kern County Office of Education. I'd like to thank the board for highlighting the impact of school climate on student success. As an LCAP reviewer, I have firsthand knowledge on the efforts LEAs are making to analyze and use school climate data to drive their continuous improvement efforts. We're seeing districts use this data to get to the root causes of other student outcome data, such as suspensions, academic achievement, and attendance. Because of the challenge many districts, not only in Kern County, but across the state are facing in regards to chronic absenteeism, LEAs are actually prioritizing school climate data to make improvement. As a matter of fact, this year we had over 30,000 students take an additional school connectedness survey to try to get at the story behind chronic absenteeism data. Some of the actions we're seeing districts take based on this data is providing professional learning on trauma-informed practices and cultural proficiency and prioritizing funding for NCSS, PBIS, and social-emotional learning. This need has been so great in our county that our office has created a new department focused on equity and inclusion to support our district's improvement efforts. Thank you so much for your attention this afternoon. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. 
My name is Jessica Pregolsky. I work as the Director of Data and Engagement at the Sonoma County Office of Education. I'm going to be calling on behalf of my organization and the 40 school districts we serve. I want to offer our appreciation of and support for the state focus on school climate data. Locally, we've come to rely on the Youth Truth Survey as a powerful tool for our own continuous improvement within and across LEAs. Um, our local youth truth effort grew from two pilot high schools back in 2017 to more than a, to 142 school sites across 30 school districts this year. We've heard from 60,000 Sonoma County students, staff, and family members, and that information has been strategically used to inform and even integrated into LCAPs across state priority areas in an effort to improve the academic and life outcomes of our students and their families. The Youth Truth Survey allows us to monitor for whom those efforts are working and for whom they're not. We're actually able to disaggregate reports across more than 13 demographic subgroups that reveal insights related to our students with disabilities, multilingual learners, students of color, among others. So super excited and appreciative that we're able to spotlight our local uh, school climate effort that's become an integral part about how we think about doing school in Sonoma County. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Sally Fox, and I represent the California Association for Bilingual Education, CAVE. Uh, school climate is important in providing the necessary sociocultural environment for success for our 1.1 million English learners. Item 5, Implementation and Use of School Climate Surveys for Priority 6, is an opportunity for improvement if we require LEAs to report survey results by student groups and overall school score for all. On another note, having a set of four to five key questions that are standard for all LEAs would help compare data statewide. Please help LEAs do better by requiring them to analyze surveys and make appropriate changes for the better. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Hello, Chair Darling Hammond and board members. My name is Dr. Ashley Gervin, and I'm an instructional coach at Desert Sands Unified School District and a Teach Plus California Policy Fellow. Understanding school culture and climate from only an educator's perspective limits our ability to meet the needs of all students. When schools look at culture and climate data, Teachers, administrators, counselors, and other staff members are able to assess specific needs of students, implement supports, and monitor progress. Thank you for taking the time to explore this issue and work that the Department of Westhead are doing to support the use of this data more effectively. Nevertheless, we were disappointed to learn that the $150,000 designated in the 2021 Education Budget Trailer Bill to begin this process did not move this critical work forward. We hope that the State Board and Department of Education can put forward recommendations to get this process back on track. My Teach Plus Policy Fellows and I would love to partner with you in continuing this important work. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Good afternoon, Jessica Sacco on behalf of Children Now. My thanks to President Darling Hammond and Vice President Glover Woods for their comments immediately preceding this public comment period. School climate happens at the school level. We know from a review of the California Healthy Kids Survey data that there, are often, uh, uh, that there are often differences in how demographically similar students experience school compared to students in other demographically similar uh, groups. We also know that schools within a district may have dramatically different climates, and positive school climates can improve student outcomes. It is for these reasons I urge the board to consider how our state's accountability system can better support the reporting of school climate data at both the school and student group level. Additionally, I urge the board to reflect on the lack of accountability and transparency that has been built into our local indicators model. I refer you to both the Equity Coalition and Alliance for Student Success letters regarding this item for our full comment. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Lillis, Executive Director of Teach Plus California. We're pleased that the board is spending this afternoon considering the importance of school climate for student success and well-being. No one could have made it clear how important positive and culturally affirming school climate is than the students you heard from today. While we're happy that so many schools and LEAs have taken advantage of the resources of the CCSD, we believe there's more the state can do to ensure that we're prioritizing positive school climate for all students. 
We'd hope that the other school climate related allocation from the budget trailer bowl would have moved us forward to enable statewide comparable data by identifying standardized items of school climate surveys. And we understand that at the level of the allocation, $150,000, there were no applicants to do this work. Without that, we do not have a view of the disparate experiences between schools, LEAs, and groups of students. Moreover, the state cannot ensure that schools and districts who are struggling to provide the positive, safe, and culturally affirming school climate will help get the help they need. While the support of Westhead is providing represents progress, we do not know if it's reaching the communities that need it most. We recommend the state board direct CDE staff to provide guidance for how to move forward collecting and reporting more consistent school climate survey data across the state. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. This is Liz Guillen with Public Advocates, uh, also for the uh, LCFF Equity Coalition. Um, the good work presented today by West Ed and San Diego uh, are commendable. I was happy to hear that despite different surveys, there are similar questions that provide valid and reliable data. But are they comparable? Can we require LEAs to take some action about it? The flexibility currently allowed to LEAs on this indicator is a real disservice to students and their families and advocates as we try to improve students' experiences. The dashboard report is not an indication of school climate, good, poor, or indifferent. It is merely an indicator that the LEA administered a survey at least every other year in at least one grade within a grade band and reported something about it. We note that the dashboard report is simply a report that the LA took these steps, um, but not that they did anything about it. Vice President Glover Woods underscored that LEA should be required to report survey results by student groups and overall score for all students. LEA should be required to include analyses of items on their surveys. They are not required to do this. I echo the comments uh, by Sarah Lillis just before me that the state can do better and we need to move forward to collect and report more consistent school climate survey data. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Linda darling and State Board of Education members. My name is Caitlin Jung with the Association of California School Administrators. ACTS understands and values the importance of school climate for student success and well-being. Our school and district leaders rely on data from local school climate surveys to drive improvement efforts to ensure our schools are positive environments that support and embrace all of our students, staff, and families. Were there a minimum requirement that apply to the school's climate survey? LAs rely on the flexibility provided so that they can determine what survey instrument and the frequency that is most appropriate and useful for their school communities. This flexibility is important given the diversity of the students we serve so that the local surveys are responsive to our families' cultures, languages, experiences, and other local factors. ACTS also appreciates the work of CDE and West Ed to provide training for LAs on interpreting local school climate survey data. This will help our LAs to be more adept and effective in understanding student voices and translating that feedback into needed school improvement efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Good afternoon, President Darling Hammond, Vice President Glover Woods and members of the board. This is Derek Lennox with the California County Superintendents. On behalf of the 58 County Superintendents of Schools, we agree. A positive school climate is essential to student success in collecting these data serve as an important baseline for youth voice to guide the continuous improvement plans such as the LCAP. Throughout the state, we see LEAs utilizing a wide variety of tools to evaluate and improve the unique school climates at the district, school site, and classroom levels. Our LEAs use uh, these data to identify and address areas needed to ensure every student feels safe and connected to their daily learning environment. We provided more specific examples in our letter to the board and would welcome opportunities to continue the discussion on the ways our LEAs use school climate data to drive their equity work and continuous improvement plans. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes public comment for item number five. All right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all of the comments from all of the callers. Uh, really um, an important topic. And I now want to um, open this up for board discussion. Uh, and I know that Vice President Glover Woods, you are reserving uh, a little bit of time for some more comments there, but let's see if uh, there are others who also want to get in the mix. Uh, Member McQuillan, uh, we'll start with you. 
Thank you. And I really appreciate this topic also on school climate, especially as we struggle to come out of the pandemic. And I heard one of the presenters talking about the COVID related uh, impacts on some of the data. I was curious about additional impacts on our current data, but it's such an important topic when we hear about substance abuse and school violence and all the things that are related to this topic. Uh, with school with student behavior. Um, I'm, I'm hoping and I'm sure it's there somewhere that we're connecting this effort with the community schools development, you know, as schools mm -hmm. apply for and uh, um, plan the, the community school efforts. Uh, and then uh, I'm sure it's there also somewhere about best practices as we go through the various LEAs and individual schools that we see uh, best practices or promising practices where it could be a hotline or other efforts where we're monitoring school, um, the students and, and, and their wellness and that there's a place where those who aren't far, far along in this process can go to and see those best practices to try to model after those. So, uh, I'm hoping there's an effort there. There probably is, but uh, thank you for this topic and, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And just um, a note that in the legislation for community schools, it does explicitly call on those schools to work around social emotional learning uh, and uh, school climate and restorative practices. So uh, to your point, we hope that that will actually be a very explicit part of the school development process. Um, Kim Patillo Brunson. Uh, I also just wanted to thank you all for the presentation. It was both sobering, but also just incredibly powerful. I, I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit more about how data collection looks in the younger grades, in the sort of TK, K, and one, before kids are necessarily quite ready for surveys and how parent engagement works. Um, for sort of doing the data collection side of the work. Um, and then also if there are any, if you could describe some of the um, uh, practices that are emerging in terms of social emotional learning um, in those younger years. Uh, I guess uh, this could go in part to our WESTED team, but um, I'll leave it to the folks at the podium to figure out who should start us off on that. Do we have someone who can tackle that question of early learning? Yes, we do. We're talking about that now for you all. We were okay. looking at the item as well. And so to answer the question, we know that we are collecting the data in K-5. I can speak to my practice in the past where students were asked questions and the teachers were helping the younger children out. But again, it does depend on the district. I can turn it over to Tom to see if they have any information too about what they've seen from the LEAs. Terrific, thank you. Thank you. I, I don't. I don't have a whole lot uh, more to share except that there there is um, there are elementary versions of these of these surveys. Um, the CHKS is administered. Uh, there's an elementary version of that survey. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't quite have like the numbers of participation. It is less than uh, um, the, the survey. Surveys are administered less frequently in the, uh, the elementary schools than in the secondary schools. Um, but you know, I, could, I could provide that information at a later time if needed. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, I've actually seen some of this in action. Maybe some of you have, and uh, we have a second grade teacher who might be able to uh, chime in on this, but uh, sometimes the teachers are reading the questions and there are little icons for students to recognize the way in which they might answer. Um, member Lewis and then Member Olkin, uh, Member Glover Woods, and uh, Member Orozco Gonzalez, if you'd like to chime in on uh, how this happens for your second graders, that would be <laughs> uh, very useful also. Member Lewis. Okay. Thank you, uh, President Darling Hammond, and thank you um, to all of you who uh, presented that report. And it was really great hearing all that information from San Diego Unified and how you're using the data. I think it's a great example uh, of good use of the data and putting it in, into practice and making 
the school environment uh, safe and welcoming and conducive for learning for, for our students. Just a, just a couple of things uh, to point out and then a question. Um, Vice President Glover Woods has already brought up the, the concern about the disaggregation of data, but it, within the calls to and uh, within some of the correspondence we had, um, there was a concern about uh, the development of standardized questions uh, that could be used across districts across the state so that there's some type of, I think it, the goal is accountability and making sure that the that s districts are using the surveys to move things in a positive direction uh, for students and student outcomes. And I just, if I could get information about the the 150,000 that was designated, it seemed like that there was a process to begin doing that, if that's correct, standardizing a few items um, to go on the survey, because that would also take care of some of the concerns that some of the district leaders have about keeping flexibility within the survey so that they can make the survey, uh, you know, contain questions that they feel they're important to their district but also giving some standardized questions for everyone to use to be able to disaggregate the data uh, by student groups and, and uh, also by race, ethnicity, gender, LGBTQ, all of those things to see how students are really faring on our camp campuses and get an honest uh, view of what we schools and districts need to do to, to make them feel comfortable. So is that work? Um, what, uh, someone mentioned that they couldn't find someone to initiate that project. If that's so, is there a plan B uh, for that and um, the plans for moving forward with that? I know that's a lot, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully. Do you want, do you want okay, to let's answer that. The, maybe about the, the process for the uh, developing the standardized questions that could be used. Uh, maybe that question uh, first, and then I guess my other question is, um, you know, as a board, um, do, would we have the leverage, what is our leverage to be able to make the requirements for uh, disaggregating the data, if that's a direction that we, we choose to go to start a discussion about those questions and how to assist districts in, in making more use of the data because it sounds like a lot of districts are they're they're trying to use the data to inform decisions but to make the process even better to make sure that um, all districts are using the data uh, mm -hmm. effectively right and just on that second question this is a matter that is in the board's purview so we will be considering those questions as a board um, and okay to William he may want to say something about um, your first question, which was um, what happened when we did not find someone to respond to the uh, the earlier RFP. Well, did you want to yes, tackle absolutely. any of that right now? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, President Darlingham. And, and to you, Member Lewis, um, I do have Hilva Chan here, who's from the whole child division. That was a question that we did discuss, and so she can give us a brief update and information on that. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, I just want to provide a quick update. So the CDE did issue a RFP back in October 2021, trying to find a contractor to, prov to provide um, the study, uh, trying to conduct a study on um, the standardized school climate survey. So we only received one application, and the applicant later withdrew the application because they couldn't find a subcontractor to conduct some psychometric studies. So we're unable to implement this, and the money went back to the, uh, to what we, we, we reverted back. So let me just say that um, there's still an interest in our uh, board consideration of these questions about wh whether and how we might want to move ahead with, you know, a variety of elements here, you know, about periodicity, the frequency of the survey, the ways in which it might be analyzed and the extent to which there might be some standardized questions. So those are not off the table, they are on our table. And we will be, you know, thinking about these things over this month and coming months. Um, Member Olkin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to first say, um, in in a way of saying thank you to our presenters, that this is yet another um, presentation at the State Board where I'm just blown away by the 
expert um, support and um, work across the state. Um, and one of the things that's become really clear to me in, in having the privilege to sit in this seat is um, there's so much good work and we can learn so much from each other. Um, and so, for example, the, the California Center for School Climate, um, I'm going to be on your website myself uh, and looking into your resources and um, San Diego Unified. Uh, thank you so much for those very specific examples of the way you use school climate data to make changes um, at both the, the sort of micro level, teachers in the hallways, to the macro level, um, staffing and systems of support. And um, that really kind of gets to the, the heart of my comment, which is, I think we all know this, but one of the really important um, reasons that um, this school climate data matters is because it can help us make changes at both the, the, the micro and the macro level. Um, and I think that um, some of the tension that we're hearing between wanting systemized questions or um, standard questions and wanting schools to be able to um, design questions or, or surveys at the site level speaks to that because if you wanted if you want to make change at the system level we need to be able to see some standardized results and if you want to be able to implement change at the very local level you need data that responds to the work you're doing um, and so um, I appreciate sort of both sets of priorities and I am excited. I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversations where we as a board try and figure out how to balance both of those needs in this um, with this data because um, as Vice President Glover would said, um, I, I believe how students feel um, at school, their sense of safety, their sense of connection, um, their sense of inclusion, um, the, if they believe that people there think they matter and can be successful is the most important predeterminant for academic success. Um, they just go hand in hand. And so um, I look forward to more of this conversation and um, I thank everybody for the good work they're doing. Terrific, thank you. Um, I have member Orozco Gonzalez, member Yoshimoto Tari and member Glover Woods um, queued up. Uh, member Orozco Gonzalez. Thank you again for the presentation. And as a second grade teacher, you know, I always think of, you know, when students attend school with a positive school climate, they feel valued and they feel seen. And it's that connectedness. Um, as a second grade teacher, I always cultivate classroom chemistry and community by fostering authentic relationships, um, understanding how they, where and how they come from. And when that starts is usually um, in our morning meetings. That's a great opportunity for learners to develop empathy as they learn to listen with understanding and consider how to best respond to their peers. We also partner up and we engage in conversations to um, just discuss our everyday needs and how to um, navigate relationships. Um, Sometimes we just shine a light on student. We um, on students often um, teachers overlook certain students. So I'm making a point to have a few students written down on my uh, lesson plans to say kind of a check in how they're doing. We even develop some um, collaboration strategies and discussion points, sentence frames, and so forth, just to have those critical conversations and give them an opportunity to have an engagement. And I always say honor student experience, uh, reflect on it, have time to structure inquiry and dialogue in the class. As a school-wide and as a district, we, um, we definitely do that. We do, um, sometimes our administration pops into our morning meetings, even at the district level, we will have superintendents and, and so forth come in and um, celebrate um, community at our schools. And, and again, it's children feeling connected to school. 
And uh, I recently read an article about how, because I have a high schooler, about how he can be more successful in school. And it's the more he participates, I think of those 40 developmental assets, which one of them is to be, to feel connected and to feel that they're an active participant at school. And um, he's in sports and in clubs. And I feel that that's just the beginning of foundation to feel successful and to be seen and feel motivated to participate in a community. So um, those are awesome ideas, but I know as a second grade teacher, it's about inclusivity, being seen and heard. You know, I think that giving children opportunities to um, constantly throughout the day to have dialogue and with their peers and with their teachers. And hopefully those kinds of opportunities show up in the way that students both respond in the classroom and uh, provide information on these kinds of surveys. Uh, thank you and so much. Back to, oh, can I just add just with, yeah. uh, with assessments? I just made a connection about that because what I really deeply love about performance tasks and uh, when we're um, having those conversations around that is that with the opportunity that the students have, to explain their thought process. That's also part of um, their learning. So it's all connected today. So thank you. <laughs> uh, member Yoshimaru Tauri and then Member Glover Woods, and then we'll come back around to Member Rodriguez. Thank you. I thank you again for this presentation. Um, particularly, I think what we know and what we're still learning about the neuroscience piece. Um, what I, everything I'm reading suggests that school climate indicators may in fact have more impact on the other dashboard indicators than we commonly express and commonly talk about. Mm -hmm. And so that being said, I imagine there's a way to move the process forward, um, perhaps in a both and way, right? Which both identifies a subset of standard items, um, particularly because I think that uniquely positions indicator six to have across the district conversations and across mm -hmm. district conversations and use it as an improvement tool um, not just within one LEA. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think we can do that. There's a way to do that in terms of change management that still honors stakeholder input, uh, maintains options for multiple measure data, and also provides a solution that honors the LEA's options to address local needs. Um, so I'm confident that there's a way through that and uh, I'm excited to learn more and, and be a part of that. And lastly, I just wanted to second um, what Vice President Glover Woods mentioned about disaggregated data. I think there's great importance in being able to drill down uh, in the data because the action steps taken could be very different depending on what that data suggests. Yes, thank you so much. Um, member Glover Woods, then we'll have Member Rodriguez and Member Escobedo. Thank you. Um, and just to continue along with the conversation and uh, the recognition that we know um, students different students experience school in different ways, whether it be our intent or not, that does happen. And when I think about our African-American student group, um, our LGBTQ plus student community, um, newcomers, and um, those who are English learners, especially um, English learners that are at the earlier levels of English language proficiency, uh, their experiences in school can look very different from the experiences of others. And uh, just as I reflect on uh, the phenomenal students we had an opportunity to hear from today um, when we were uh, had our earlier item, item two, and uh, many of the students we have opportunity to hear from when we have, um, we had the student community group, it wasn't the student community group, but the students that spoke with us when we were appointing our student board member and things of that sort. We have students that are having some phenomenal experiences on our campuses. Um, and again, the reality is we have some students who are not. And one of the key ways for us to get to who those students are and how we can best support those students and students overall is through that disaggregation of data. Um, as a practitioner, my thought was, okay, maybe the data is just way too difficult to disaggregate because I do realize at the LEA level, it sounds all well and good to say, okay, you should do this, but actually being able to do it can always meet with some challenges. But I was encouraged by, I believe it was Tom that said, the instruments that are being used um, by the majority of our LEAs already have that disaggregation 
capability built in. So one of the things that I really um, am encouraging us and would like to see us engage in more conversation about in the future is how we can ensure that the school climate data is disaggregated by student group and shared and reported in that way. Um, one of the other reasons for that is how the community can also be partners in this work of creating positive experiences for students on campuses. We have community groups, we have our parents, we have all types of people and groups and organizations that want to help so that students experience school well and are able to be successful. Having this data disaggregated in such a way that can help point to ways we can partner, point to actions that can be implemented to make school experience a more positive one for our students is something that I think is very important for us to do. And I do hope we'll be engaging in additional conversation in future meetings. Thank you. Thank you, um, Member Rodriguez and Member Escobedo. Naomi, did I just see your hand start to go up? No? <laughs> okay, uh, just ruminating, okay. Uh, Member Rodriguez. Thank you, President Darling Hammond. And um, thank you to our presenters. The, this has uh, been a, a very rich conversation and uh, school climate is definitely a, uh, an important factor in student success, without a doubt. Um, and I'm very proud of the steps that my school district has taken with regard to the surveys. Um, you know, we've, uh, they, the, the data is shared with us at staff meetings. So we're able to think about and, and place where our students are, right? How many students are, have considered suicide, have considered, um, have gotten uh, close, right? You know, have gone beyond thinking about it and actually have attempted it. And it really brings a reality to us of who we have in our classrooms, right? And, and the emotional issues that our students are facing, um, issues of identity, ethnic identity, gender identity, um, and it creates, you know, that empathy that um, Member Orozco was talking about, right? You know, it brings it to us so that we can see what we're going to do with that information. Um, as one of the members of the SEL team at my school, we definitely use this information when we're planning activities for our students. Um, and we have a counselor for a day at our school. So any child that needs to go speak to somebody, um, they, the counselor's available to them. And our counselors have been trained in crisis intervention. So they have tools to find out at what level a student is facing crisis. Um, and then they can refer them to, we also have a mental health specialist um, that is available to students in crisis. So all of this is because of these surveys um, and because of this information. And I'd also like to echo the, um, the desire to see this, this data disaggregated, right? And to be able to break it down into the student population that perhaps is facing more crises. Um, and I also like to add another aspect of school climate, which is um, how that relates to teachers, uh, right? You know, as, as teachers, we're working with our students on a daily basis and school climate also affects us. Certain decisions that are made, um, that are uh, that our leadership made so structural decisions, and um, perhaps there's a way to incorporate our voice as well. I noticed that you know in the two QR codes that were shared, uh, one of them, the Cal Schools, which is a CDE website, um, has a school staff survey, uh, but it's you know and, and maybe that's a good place to start. Um, but there are other issues about, you know, how decisions are made, what the culture of schools are, because that uh, works, that goes to teacher satisfaction, which goes to teacher burnout, how long teachers stay in the classroom, right? All of these issues that we're dealing with at another level. And I'd like to quote an article um, by Matthew Kraft and Grace Falcon of Brown University, Why School Climate Matters for Teachers and Students. Um, School climates consist of a constellation of organizational features that shape teachers' and students' experiences. Strong school climates are characterized by supportive leadership, teacher collaboration, 
high expectation for students and a collective commitment to support student learning. Teaching is a social career and the relationships that teachers have with those who support their work in the classroom, administrators and colleagues heavily influence teacher satisfaction and, and success. So just something that I'd like to put out there uh, for the future to start thinking about adding um, a teacher survey as well uh, down the line. Thank you. Terrific. Um, Member Escobedo. Dr. Hammond, Heide said it so eloquently about the, you know, what school climate is the whole interaction of not just students among each other, but the adults and the students, which I would also include parents. You know, I'm not suggesting for this to be a state level uh, look, but perhaps resources that can be provided to districts that they can include in their LCAP to measure right climate that affects parents as well as our teachers and classified as well. So I, I think, uh, you know, it's a very complex issue and the resources that we provide to our districts can help them un understand what climate is all about. So thank you, Trustee Haide, for sharing that as well. Terrific. Um, Member Porter. Thank you. So the conversation, I think, especially between Member Rodriguez and Member Rosco Gonzalez about empathy and students kind of feeling connected to staff kind of sparked um, what I've seen very successfully implemented in the districts and schools that I've talked to, and that's having student advisory groups that meet regularly, whether it be with principals, with superintendents on the school or district-wide level. And I think this is a great way for students to directly engage with their principals and with their classified staff and to really feel supported at school. Um, because it's one thing to kind of have these surveys once a year, but it's another thing to kind of directly gauge um, kind of how students are doing and to have an ongoing conversation. And so that's just something that I would encourage principals, superintendents to consider is having student advisory groups to kind of continue that ongoing conversation about what school climate looks like as it is constantly changing throughout the year. Terrific. Yeah, I think we're getting really down into the roots of the needs in the schools that are trying to be responsive to students. You know, we inherited a factory model 100 years ago, and we've been trying to make it work for relationships for a long time. And some of the changes like what you um, call for, uh, Member Porter, around advisory groups that um, you know, give a regular opportunity for a family group uh, and social emotional supports in schools is one of the kinds of elements that some schools have undertaken that allow us to go beyond measuring climate, but actually building the kind of climate for concern and caring that we need. Um, so I'm really, uh, in this conversation, just proud to be part of this group of board members and um, really benefited so much from the presentations. I, I wanna note that our um, on our dashboard currently, uh, you know, we have um, a, a measure on, on engagement of suspension rates, which is intended to um, incentivize schools to reduce exclusion as a response to students and to increase inclusion. Uh, but there's a lot more that one has to do than simply not suspend students. You have to create an environment in which there are alternatives to exclusion, in which there is community building, in which there's the building of opportunities for conflict resolution and community and, and support. Um, and a lot of schools have been doing that, uh, and that shows up in their school climate indicators, uh, those that have been putting in place things like um, advisories and others, support mechanisms for relationships, uh, restorative practices, um, which include community circles, kind of like the morning meeting that you would see in elementary school that you know include the uh, opportunities for conflict resolution for um, you know students to be in um, a conversation with each other about how not to harm each other and how to be supportive of each other on a regular basis are really important. And there's some evidence um, coming out, some of it uh, very recent, that when those practices are in place, many of them measured through the set of items on the Healthy Kids Survey, uh, you see gains in achievement, you see reductions in exclusion and dis disparate discipline, which often is uh, discriminatory uh, by race. You see um, 
uh, reductions in mental health, suicidal ideation and um, anxiety and depression. Uh, so we know something about the practices that really do make a difference uh, in achievement, attendance, and uh, self um, and well-being. All of which also, as uh, Member Rodriguez said, also supports uh, educators in being better connected and supported and and having well-being. So I think uh, you know we see the value of these surveys. Those that are using them. Uh, regularly and disaggregating them and really building them into a continuous improvement process uh, are getting the benefits their students and their educators are getting the benefits of that. Um, so I hope that um, uh, when we um, come back uh, in March, I guess, is our next opportunity uh, and we see how many uh, districts are already benefiting from this, uh, that we could ask the CDE to bring an item in March that uh, looks at these questions of the frequency of the survey, uh, the ways in which we have expectations in the self-reflection tool for how those surveys might be analyzed and used, uh, and whether there is a possibility for some thoughtfully uh, selected common items that would, as uh, Member Olkin put it, allow for the flexibility of you know, local uh, engagement around uh, an improvement process and a set of items, but also allow for some uh, comparison across uh, schools and districts. Um, I hope we will be able then to carry this conversation uh, forward at that time. I also just want to note that there are a number of states that do um, include teacher surveys. Uh, and so I think that's a whole nother conversation uh, of uh, educator and staff surveys. Uh, that can augment um, what we learn from students in ways that help us build a healthy environment for everyone. So uh, something to put in the um, bicycle parking lot uh, for the, you know, for a future opportunity to discuss as well. Um, this is an information item. It was obviously a rich uh, item and we will return to some of these issues uh, very soon. Uh, and now we have earned another 15 minute break. So it is about 1.40. We'll see you back at 1.55. Remember not to leave the meeting, just turn off your mic and your camera. Welcome back. And um, to establish our quorum, I'm gonna ask Brooks to call the roll. Welcome back, member Yoshimoto Tauri. Here. Member Rodriguez. Here. Member Porter. Here. Member Patillo Brownson. Here. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Here. We don't know what that was. Uh, <laughs> Member oh, Olcom. Here. <laughs> Member McQuillan. Here. Member Lewis. Here. Vice President Glover Woods. Here. Member Escobedo. Here. President Darlene Hammond. Here. Everyone's present. All right, so now we're gonna take up the regular consent items, which are six through nine. Uh, I understand that member Yoshimoto Tari needs to recuse herself from this vote. Uh, you can do that by turning off your camera and microphone member Yoshimoto Tari and stay close to your computer so we can get you back after the vote. Uh, members of the public wishing to provide comment on consent items six through nine may do so by calling the telephone number using the access code provided on the slide that is shown now. So we're going to give a moment of wait time in case there are any public comments. All right, do we have anyone calling in? Uh, there are current, oh. Uh, there is one person in the queue for public comment. I will open the phone line now. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute, your time starts now. Good afternoon, uh, this is Liz Guillen with Public Advocates also for the LTFF Equity Coalition. Regarding item A, the board is required under federal law to, um, to approve the school site improvement plans. These are the comprehensive support and improvement schools. We uh, repeat our strong concern as we have every year that we don't think you're doing a good enough job in overseeing 
the approval of the school site plan. These schools represent the most challenged school sites in the state, and they're on the CSI list in part because they haven't received the attention they need or oversight from their LEA. The way the uh, department presents them to you is that the counties have approved the LCAPs, which are supposed to indicate that these plans have been looked at. But we don't think that's very comprehensive, and we don't think that's uh, good enough. We think that there's really no external state educational agency actually reviewing CSI plans, and we don't think the federal law requires Thank you, Father. Your time is up. And it looks like we have one more caller. Um, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, Jessica Sacco on behalf of Children Now. The comprehensive support and improvement schools are our schools with the lowest 5% of performance across multiple state indicators. These schools need to make significant improvements, and that starts with having a local plan to lead their change process. You as a board member are being asked to approve on a board consent item without discussion, a set of school level improvement plans for these schools without any external entity reviewing these plans. We believe that this is an insufficient level of review of, of our most at need schools. We encourage the board to schedule a deeper conversation on this issue and identify how some entity in the broader system of support could provide support for these schools by reviewing their plans and making recommendations to the board on whether a CSI plan should or should not be approved. I refer you to both the Equity Coalition and Alliance for Student Success letters regarding this item for our full comment. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes public comment for the regular consent items. Uh, 06 through 09. Okay. Um, given that there's no further public comment, uh, I'll ask for a motion on consent items 6 through 9. Member Olkin? I move, sure. Yeah. Uh, and uh, is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hold a roll call vote. Brooks, please call the roll. Member Yoshimoto Tauri. She's recused. Thank you. <laughs> it's just habit now. Uh, Member Rodriguez. Yes. Member Porter. Yes. Member Patillo Brownson. Yes. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Yes. Member Olkin. Yes. Member McQuillan. Aye. Member Lewis. Yes. Vice President Glover Woods. Yes. Member Escobedo. Yes. President Darlin Hammond. Yes. The motion carries. All right, thank you very much. And uh, we need member Yoshimoto Tauri back now. There she is. Okay. Um, Item five is the developments in the expansion of transitional kindergarten. Update on the universal pre-K um, and the pre-K to third grade alignment. This is exciting for us um, because it's one of our first opportunities to hear how things are going with the um, scaling up of universal pre-K. Uh, there is no recommended action at this time. Uh, before we start the presentation, I'd just like to help frame the discussion a little bit. The adoption of universal pre-K by the legislature and the governor expands access to preschool education in a way that is really unmatched in scope and quality by any other state in the country. Uh, you heard reference to that earlier uh, today. At this historic moment, we need to help local education agencies focus on offering pre-K programs that are designed to maximize opportunities for developmental growth and encouragement, to give every child a strong start in school, and in reviewing the public comment that we've received to date on this item, I'm reminded that it's not always clear which entities have decision-making authority for our early education programs. The purview of the State Board of Education is limited to grades K-12, which includes transitional kindergarten as the first year of a two-year kindergarten program. So the California State Preschool Program and the other early education programs are under the authority of the state superintendent, uh, the Department of Social Services, the legislature, and in the case of Head Start, the federal government. Uh, so there's a multifaceted governance structure of which uh, we are a part for the um, part of for the transitional kindergarten 
element. Uh, additionally, the state board cannot appropriate state funds. Um, so we uh, have had some comment about places where funding may be needed. We do, however, have responsibility to set policies for important TK through 12 programmatic components related to curriculum, instruction, and assessment, for determining the accountability measures and data collection for K-12. And this item will provide some baseline information for our continuing engagement in this space. We look forward to continuing to work with the interest holders, the department, the legislature, and the administration to fully realize the promise of universal pre-kindergarten. And this item will be presented by Sarah Neville Morgan and Stephen Profiter of the CDE. Sarah and Stephen, please begin. Thank you so much, Board Chair Darling Hammond. We re are really excited about being before the board today to do this historic item. So my name is Sarah Neville Morgan, and I'm a Deputy Superintendent of Public Instruction in the Opportunities for All branch at the California Department of Education under State Superintendent Tony Thurmond. I'm joined today by Stephen Profiter, the Director of the Early Education Division, and we're really excited to share all the work we've been doing on Youth PK, including the expansion of TK. Before we dive in, we wanted to provide some level setting on what we mean by UPK or universal pre-kindergarten. UPK is the expansion of the state's mixed delivery system to meet the early education needs of three and four-year-old children and their families. In California, we're relying heavily on transitional kindergarten or TK, which will be the only program universally available to all four-year-old children by 2025-26. Um, UPK is an essential part of transforming California's educational system and giving every student in California a great start. The creation of UPK in California was recommended by California's Master Plan for Early Learning and Care, or our master plan, which sets forth the goals for the administration to establish and support UPK. The State Board of Education plays an important role in UPK because the board has oversight over transitional kindergarten, as board member Darling Hammond laid out. As this is an informational item and does not provide any recommendations, the information we are sharing with you today is intended to ensure you are fully informed about the status of TK and how it fits into a bigger picture of UPK. In this presentation, we will highlight curriculum, assessment, instructional materials and workforce requirements, and professional learning alignment, as those areas may come before the board, either as TK-specific items or in the context of other information and action items. We also would like to recognize some components covered in this item are outside of the board's authority. For example, investments in certain program requirements like adult-child ratios, among other things. However, we have included them to provide context for the system in which the board's responsibility lies. California's master plan laid out a roadmap for ensuring California's children thrive in their early years and explicitly called for um, promoting school readiness and increasing long-term school performance and educational outcomes by expanding access over time to achieve one year of free, universally available and inclusive pre-K for all four-year-old children and expanding targeted access or targeted universalism to an additional year of publicly funded pre-K for all three-year-old children who are income eligible and well as children with disabilities. Through UPK's mixed delivery system, we will achieve universal access to TK for four-year-old children and have also a variety of other pre-K options within the system, which we'll go over in upcoming slides, and those will serve a growing number of three-year-old children in high-quality pre-K programs, as well as some four-year-olds whose families still choose that as their parent option. These not only will equip our children with school readiness and healthy development, but also prepare them for lifelong success. I also wanna elevate the master plan's recommendation to support children's learning and development by investing in our early educator workforce. We all know how critical the teachers are, including providing ongoing opportunities for professional development, creating new workforce pathways and accelerating and enhancing existing ones and creating a pre-K to third grade ECE teaching credential. 
and implementing program standards that support educators to nurture children's learning and development. As we work to follow the roadmap set out in the master plan, we would like to emphasize that UPK is also a key part of the state superintendent's larger transforming schools initiative. Implementation of UPK alongside other investments in community schools, professional learning, anti-bias education, mental health programs, expanded learning programs, and universal meals. All of those are interconnected and present a historic opportunity to transform California schools into safe havens that support and nurture the whole child. We're really excited about the interconnected nature of these investments and the opportunity to leverage them to build a preschool to third grade or P3 alignment in our system. This historical universal approach to education is an opportunity for California to rethink or reimagine our educational system as one that brings equity to all students and families and also provides great opportunities for teachers and those interested in becoming teachers from those serving the littles all the way up through our pipeline. While TK is the only universally available program, we do wanna highlight that it's part of a broader, diverse and incredibly valuable system of programs serving our youngest learners. UPK brings together TK as well as all of our existing California state preschool programs and federal early education programs, as well as um, private childcare, family childcare, and expanded learning opportunities, including before and after school programs that help achieve a full day, full year support for families and ensure a preschool learning experience. UPK is backed by an abundance of research demonstrating the positive benefits of the pre-kindergarten year prior to K to 12 in both short and long-term outcomes. The most consistently identified effects are on academic achievement at the end of pre-K and the beginning of K. Children who participate in quality pre-K have increased school readiness in both academic and in social emotional skills. Children who were able to attend two years of the Abbott Preschool Program in New Jersey had even stronger gains than those who attended for one year. Importantly, much of the research on the early and targeted pre-K programs have indicated the strongest effects are for African-American and Hispanic Latino children, multilingual learners, and children from low-income families when they have access to quality programs. In addition, longtime evidence from the Abbasidarian, the Chicago Parent Center, and new ones from Abbott, New Jersey studies indicate that children who attend pre-K experience lower rates of special education placement and grade retention in elementary school. Increased school readiness really lays that foundation for later academic success as well. Both the Abbott Preschool programs in New Jersey and the Tulsa, Oklahoma program finds that from third grade through high school, children who attended the pre-K programs and who continue to have quality learning experiences have higher scores on standardized tests in math, language, and literacy. In the Perry, Chicago Parent Centers, and Tulsa, children who attend pre-K also have been found to have a higher likelihood of graduating from high school. Finally, research from the early preschool programs, Abbasidarian, Perry, and the Child Parent um, Child Parent Center and the Tulsa, Oklahoma pre-K programs have shown, shown strong positive effects for pre-K attendees in adulthood. In Tulsa, after they turn 18, children who attended their school-based pre-K programs had both increased rates of voter registration and voting in elections, showing stronger civic engagement. That was one of those novel found findings that we just learned about. The Abbasidarian Chicago Parent Center and Tulsa, Oklahoma programs all identified higher rates of college enrollment or attendance for those who attended the pre-K programs. In Tulsa, pre-K participants from all racial ethnic groups had higher rates of two-year college enrollment and African-American and Hispanic participants had higher rates of four-year college enrollment as well. Finally, there is evidence of positive effects on adult health from the earliest programs. 
Among the Abbasidarian, Perry Preschool, and Chicago Parent Centers, they found lower rates of teen pregnancy, hypertension, diabetes, and depressive symptoms in children who attended quality pre-K programs. So a lot there in the rich, robust research world. Moving into our alignment between systems, UPK also serves as a bridge between the early learning and care systems and the TK through 12 grade or TK to 12 system. We know a strong start in pre-K is only beneficial if it is sustained and we can't deliver on that promise of UPK without the alignment and support of the early grades reinforcing and building off and accelerating children's previous pre-K experiences. Because of this, the CDE has also developed a preschool to third grade or P to three vision to set forth the intention and goals of UPK to thrive in that broader P to three system. The graphic you see right now comes from the National P3 Center, which is supporting us to create a strategic plan around P3. Our CDE mission statement for P3 is that all children have a strong and early start to inclusive education through high quality, joyful, rigorous, developmentally informed and coherent preschool through third grade learning opportunities to ensure they thrive in school and and in life and are college and career ready. The goals of this alignment initiative are to ensure first that we give all children a strong start by providing them that access with at least one year and for at promise children at least two years of high quality early education experiences. Two, we ensure all PK to three elementary teachers are equipped to sustain support and sustain learning by enhancing the teacher's competencies to optimally support child learning and development and implement instructional practices to sustain children's learning from K to three. Three, we equip education leaders at the county, district, and school level so they understand the value of early education and support strong transitions for student success and enact organizational strategies to support meaningful alignment across that P to three learning continuum. And lastly, to empower and support families so they have meaningful engagement opportunities across the early years in pre-K and in the K to three settings that encourage them to play an active role as advocates and resources to facilitate the growth and development of young learners. Throughout this presentation, you'll hear us making references to P3 and demonstrate how children and our young students can reap the benefits of TK and UPK within a P3 system that ensures developmentally supportive instruction and a focus on the whole child. I'm now gonna pass this over to Steve, who's gonna dive into some of the key elements from the item, including TK expansion and rollout. Over to you, Steve. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'll start with some context on how TK was created and expanded. So first, the uh, Kindergarten Readiness Act of 2010 changed the last eligible birth date uh, for kindergarten from December 2nd to September 1st, so that all children would enter kindergarten as slightly older five-year-olds by 2014 to support families whose kindergarten entry would be delayed by this change. It established transitional kindergarten as the first year of a two-year kindergarten program. The 2015-16 budget introduced early admittance TK as an option for children with birthdays between December 2nd and the end of the school year, further bolstering access for children in this age range. Under this option, district, districts can choose to serve children in this birthday range, but do not generate funding through average daily attendance for the child until their fifth birthday. The 2021-22 budget introduced a timeline to achieve universal TK for all four-year-old children by 25-26, as well as new TK requirements and provided funding for UPK planning and implementation and an increase in funding for expanded learning through the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program to support access to full day care. In the current year's budget, 22-23, it provided additional uh, LCFF funding for TK and established fiscal penalties related to TK average class size and teacher to child ratio. School districts and charter schools with TK receive an add-on to the LCFF entitlement for the cost of an additional adult to meet the one to 12 ratio in TK classrooms. The add-on amount is equal to the TK add-on rate 
uh, $2,813, multiplied by the LEA's current year TK average daily attendance. Fiscal penalties apply to any school district or charter school with TK enrollment not meeting the requirements for average class size, adult to child ratio, or teacher qualifications uh, beginning in 2023-24. By 25-26, we will achieve full implementation of universal TK, meaning all children turning four by September 1 will be eligible. This table, included on page 12 of the item, shows a timeline for changes in age eligibility for ETK or early admittance TK and TK during TK expansion, showing that two months of birth dates for children turning five are added in each year starting this year up until full implementation in 2526 when all children turning four by September 1 will be eligible. So what does expansion of TK mean for projected enrollment? The Learning Policy Institute has projected that TK enrollment will more than triple by 2526 and serve approximately 70% of the eligible four-year-old population in California at full implementation. So what is TK implementation looking like right now? We've covered all of the areas of TK implementation listed here in detail in the item. So today, we'll highlight areas that are most relevant to the board's purview and indicated in green on the slide. And those are access, curriculum, assessment, workforce qualifications, and professional learning. The two workforce areas are primarily under the purview of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing, but are important to understanding the implementation of TK. In the past two years, We've witnessed historic investments to support the expansion of TK and the planning and implementation of UPK. These include the UPK planning and implementation grant, which supports LEAs to expand access to UPK through creating or expanding CSPP or TK programs or establishing or strengthening partnerships with other UPK programs in the LEAs area. Uh, the Early Education Teacher Development Grant, which supports the workforce by funding LEAs to increase the number of early educators and increase specific competencies for TK, kindergarten, and CSPP educators. The UPK Mixed Delivery Planning Grant, which provides counties with funding to support relationship building among LEAs, the County Office of Education, the Local Planning Council, and the Local Child Care Resource and Referral to, to expand access to the mixed delivery system for three and four-year-old children and increase inclusion of children with disabilities. Our partners at the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing have developed a PK-3 Early Childhood Specialist Teaching Credential. And related to this is a charge from the 22-23 budget to establish a UPK Mixed Delivery Quality and Access Workgroup that aims to identify best practices for increasing access to high quality universal preschool programs and update preschool standards to reflect these practices. So overall, the CDE has seized on the historic opportunity these investments have created and is providing extensive support, guidance, and resources, including the creation of robust guidance documents to accompany the UPK planning and implementation grants, hosting regular UPK webinars and office hours, the creation of an FAQ page, the launch of the California UPK and P3 group on the California Educators Together platform, a P3 alignment webinar series, and a UPK communications campaign, including multilingual resources for family and community engagement that emphasize the benefits of UPK and TK for children and families and empower parents to make informed choices. To support implementation, we have, in partnership with the Commission on Teacher Credentialing, been using a constellation approach to guide all of our UPK implementation and P3 alignment efforts. The goal of this approach is to ensure that multiple sectors and levels within the state are working together to develop guidance to the field on TK implementation, including local implementers, researchers, workforce, communications, and support systems partners, among others. These partners work together in the five thematic constellations you see in this diagram, including local implementation and promising practices, research, workforce development, 
UPK support systems, and partnerships, communications, and strategy. The state leadership team and the UPK P3 kitchen cabinet with representation from early childhood education organizations and state agency partners are the leadership teams setting strategic directions and aligning the constellation to meet overarching goals. Now, I'll dive into sharing some successes related to access to TK. We want to emphasize that when we talk about access, that while districts that serve kindergartners must offer TK, TK is not mandatory for children to enroll, and families will continue to be able to choose the program that best fits their needs. Additionally, we want to note that this information is intended to provide context, as these requirements are statutory and outside of the board's purview. Now, while data from 21-22 and the current school year isn't quite available yet, the LPI projects that in this first year of expansion, 22-23, 137,000 children, or 30% 30 30 of all four-year-old children, will be served in TK. Every LEA expected to have TK enrollment received UPK planning and implementation grant funds, and as part of that, will require to present a plan for UPK to their local governing board by June 30, 2022, and submit their plans for UPK to the CDE in a survey in fall 2022. We have some useful data from the survey on the progress towards achieving universal access to TK um, and overall UPK implementation. With support from LPI, we've analyzed a sample which represents the majority of these responses, uh, including 829 school districts and 594 charter schools, which is about 97% of districts and 85% of charters with expected TK enrollment, and 62% of all districts and charters in California. In addition to these, all 58 county offices of education responded to the survey. You can refer to attachments three and four of the item for the full survey results. Um, so data from the surveys show the majority of LEAs report they intend to offer TK at all sites, which would support access to being to be evenly distributed uh, geographically. They plan to or are considering offering ETK or early admittance TK, which would accelerate expansion beyond the statutory timeline. And they intend to offer full day TK, which would support families and having the coverage they need. Additionally, 79% of LEAs plan to combine TK with expanded learning programs and 20% with the California State Preschool Program to achieve a full day. Increased access to TK will have a huge impact on families across California, especially for the 250,000 children eligible for the California State Preschool Program, but unable to enroll due to limited space, and also for the families of the 155,000 children that aren't eligible for the California State Preschool Program. LEAs are also planning for how to engage families as TK expands, with the most common strategies including family or parent surveys, local control and accountability plan educational partner input sessions, and engaging school site councils. I'll now hand this back over to Sarah. Thanks so much, Steve. We're gonna go on to curriculum. The curriculum requirement for TK is to use a modified kindergarten curriculum that is age and developmentally appropriate. It's also the intent of the legislature that TK curriculum be aligned to the California Preschool Learning Foundations. In a survey conducted this fall, we found TK programs have interpreted this language in a, tent in a variety of ways. Before we highlight those results, we want to describe what a developmentally appropriate curriculum might look like as TK curriculum is under the purview of the board. At age four, children need a lot of hands-on experiences and movement, opportunities for child-led learning, oral language development, and peer interaction through play. Exposure to key topics in social-emotional learning and developing their executive functioning skills and a scope of learning and sequence in foundational math and literacy skills. These are all components that are based in the science of learning and development. 
if you walk into a high quality pre-K classroom, this might look like less emphasis on workbooks and whole group instruction, and more time spent in small group instruction to work on foundational skills. These skills are then reinforced during center time and playful learning where children get to visit a range of centers or stations to apply their learning experiences to the dramatic play area, building areas, science exploration, art, games, ongoing projects, and the teachers are able to conduct formative assessments and scaffold the student's learning. An effective developmentally supportive curriculum also includes ample time for children to express their thinking through language. This means children are not only listening to books being read to them, but are engaging in discussion and making connections between books and topics they are learning and curious about. As highlighted earlier in our P3 slide, this philosophy of learning is needed across all the early grades, especially in the pre-K through third grade space to ensure learning remains joyful and actively engaging for our youngest learners. On page 19 of the item, you'll see a reference to the Boston Public Schools pre-K through second grade curriculum, which is a good exemplar of this philosophy in action and also a public pre-K that has strong results. As we move on to the curriculum approaches, the first one that we'll share a little bit about is the whole child curriculum. In a survey distributed this past fall to our P3 listserv, including educators and administrators in UPK programs, we asked the field what curricula they are currently using for UPK and what support they need around curriculum resources. Presented here are results from 210 district and county office administrators, 24 school site administrators and principals, and 207 TK teachers. A total of just over 450 TK programs were represented across 305 districts and 53 counties. We will walk through some key results on the next few slides, but just wanted to note, this is a subsample of TK programs and may not be representative of the larger TK population. Second, about 14% of respondents also did not have a clear idea of the curriculum used in TK in their district. And finally, the survey was unable to ascertain how well a reported curricular approach is actually being implemented, which research demonstrates is the critical component for child outcomes. Participant responses were categorized into different curricular approaches for TK. The first is what we call a pre-K comprehensive or whole child curricula circled here. These curricula are very popular in public preschool settings and typically highlight a range of developmental skills in a play-based frame. As you can see in the yellow section, 118 or 26% of TK sites that responded reported using a pre-K comprehensive whole child curriculum. Although this model can be implemented effectively, there are a few cautions to note. For strengths, this curricular approach emphasizes play-based learning through child-led centers social emotional learning and developmentally informed content. However, they often lack sufficient explicit guidance on a scope and sequence for instruction of math and literacy skills. And there is empirical evidence that domain specific curricula that target explicit math and literacy skills lead to higher gains in math and literacy compared to a whole child curricula alone with the largest achievement gaps observed for math skills in particular. Moving on, we'll go to the second curriculum approach, which is what is most aligned with the Boston Public Schools pre-kindergarten model that I mentioned just a little bit earlier. 50 TK sites, or 11% of those who completed the survey, are currently using a whole child or social emotional curriculum and a pre-K math and literacy curriculum that is developmentally appropriate. About 10% of our TK sites um, that completed the survey are also using this combination approach and are sub supplementing using district developed math and literacy units instead of the publisher version. So a smaller subset, we have the 11% and the 10%. Again, if implemented to fidelity, this approach is the most likely to be aligned with the science of learning and development, emphasizing both the whole child and providing that strong foundation in math and literacy. However, 
Because a combination of curricula is required, fidelity of implementation can be difficult to achieve and can be more costly as the teachers may need additional supports. Moving on to our curriculum approach number three, math and literacy and um, no explicit focus on social emotional learning. This last curriculum approach runs the risk, highest risk of not being developmentally supportive. About 90 TK sites or 20% who responded use a pre-K math and literacy curriculum or district developed units in math or literacy with no explicit whole child or social emotional learning curriculum supplement or integration. This typically looks like the TK program using a pre-K version of their kindergarten curriculum, but there is no evidence of an explicit social emotional learning focus or time spent in centers or play, domains that are really highlighted in our preschool learning foundations. 10% of the sites reported using the same curriculum they use for kindergarten and may have mentioned the use of social emotional learning strategies, but did not have an explicit focus on social emotional learning or time dedicated in the day for it. Well, this option might be the easiest for districts to adopt and use in a TK K combo classroom. It's also the least likely to support the learning needs of young children and less differentiation is practice and social emotional strategies are robust. For example, adjusting the curriculum for younger learners who might not be meeting the kindergarten standards and intentionally embedding social emotional topics throughout the curriculum. As TK continues to expand to younger and younger four-year-olds, we wanna ensure curriculum is developmentally supportive. A popular pre-K curriculum approach emphasizes the whole child, which highlights how all the domains of child development are connected and should be valued. For example, social emotional development is a large component of expressing language and understanding text. And executive functioning can support math learning and vice versa. And the whole child, their emotional, social, physical, and cognitive well being are all important and of value for the teacher to nurture. Overall, a whole child approach is premised on the fact that learning depends on the combination of instructional, relational and environmental factors the child experiences, along with the cognitive, social, and emotional processes that influence one another as they shape the child's growth and development. I will flag that that's a huge component around things like community schools. With TK entering the K-12 system and the creation of a pre-K to third credential, we also have an opportunity to adopt these practices from the science of learning and development in grades TK through third. For example, in our TK curriculum survey, school and district administrators and teacher respondents also listed what supports they would like for curriculum and the top responses, the top response was support for social emotional learning and adopting more play-based approaches in TK. So this is clearly a need and an opportunity to introduce whole child practices in TK to third more broadly. In fact, our early learning standards for preschool in California are based on whole child development. The preschool learning foundations, which were created by the CDE to set the learning expectations for children ages three to five, serve a similar function as the common core state standards. As you'll see detailed in the item, the first volume was released in 2008 the next in 2010, and the third volume in 2012. Because of the emphasis on the whole child, several domains of learning are highlighted. Language and literacy, math, science and social sciences, but also social emotional development, visual and performing arts, physical development, and health. We are also adding a new domain, approaches to learning, which covers children's executive functioning and self-regulation skills. The CDE also developed the preschool curriculum frameworks, which details how to apply these domains of development to learning opportunities in the classroom. To give you a better look at the format of the preschool learning foundations, the one you see on the screen before you is an example of the number sense domain in math, which details the milestone expected around age four or at the end of the first year of preschool and at age five or at the end of the second year of preschool or pre-kindergarten. 
the structures to present a foundation or learning expectation, and then examples of what that might look like in an early learning setting. In the 2021 state budget, the California Department of Education received funding to revise the preschool learning foundations. As part of those revisions, we are ensuring the content covered is inclusive of TK. Additionally, we are hoping to better align with subdomain categories in the kindergarten common core so that TK teachers can more easily crosswalk between those two sets of standards. Another major goal is to include language that is more inclusive of children with disabilities, multilingual learners, and capture the experiences of children from different racial and cultural backgrounds. The revision of this document will be available in late 2023. We also received funding to extend the Preschool Learning Foundations to third grade to illustrate the developmental continuum across the preschool to third grade period. The plan is to focus on five major domains, math, language literacy, science, social emotional development, and approaches to learning. Teachers will be able to reference this document to understand what development in these skills looks like across the learning trajectory, as well as having hands-on examples. The hope for this resource is to complement the Common Core by illustrating how preschool and developmentally supportive practices based on the science of learning and development can be integrated into the early grades while also retaining rigorous standards and expectations for learning. I'll now hand this back to Steve to share more about assessments. Thank you. I'll now move on to assessment in TK. The TK is not required to use an ongoing whole child assessment. I'll provide some context on assessment tools used in early learning and care programs since TK assessment is under the board's purview. In the California State Preschool Program, Programs use the Desired Results de Developmental Profile, or DRDP assessment, twice a year. This is a developmentally supportive assessment that aligns with principles from the science of learning for a variety of reasons. One reason is that it covers a breadth of skills, not just math and literacy, but also looks at expressive and receptive language and vocabulary, social emotional skills, and approaches to learning like self-regulation and executive functioning. The longer versions of the DRDP tool additionally look at other domains covered in the Preschool Learning Foundation, such as physical development, health habits, visual and performing arts, science, and social science. The second reason is that children are not pulled aside to work one-on-one -on -one with a teacher or computer screen. Instead, assessment is integrated into a child's natural learning environment with a teacher recording observations or prompting the child to engage in a specific skill they want to assess, such as counting, during a learning activity. The third reason is it's aligned to universal design for learning, where children are able to respond or participate in the assessment in a variety of ways based on their home language and ability. For example, when assessing counting, a child who is a dual language learner can say numbers in their home language, and a child who has trouble sitting still can demonstrate the skill by jumping or clapping while they count. While results can be calculated to form a summative score, this assessment is primarily used for formative purposes and to assist teachers in individualizing instruction and overall curriculum planning at the classroom level. This here is an example of the DRDP preschool version for one subdomain within math, number sense and quantity. This subdomain captures not only the rote counting skills, but children's understanding of quantity and making sense of what number means. To address the developmental continuum of children that could be enrolled in preschool, a wide range of skills are presented in the measure, However, at age three or the beginning of preschool, children are typically in the exploring later or building earlier domain. And by the end of preschool and transitioning into kindergarten are in building later or integrating. Here is an example from the DRDP kindergarten tool where you will see the overlap within the, pre within the preschool tool in the first three levels. Again, to emphasize that there is a developmental continuum that is present in kindergarten and different children will fall on different places on the continuum even if it is below the kindergarten entry expectations. The DRDP kindergarten tool has actually been adopted by other states to use as a kindergarten entry assessment. For example, the state of Illinois has adapted this tool as their mandatory kids assessment into kindergarten entry in the domains of math, language, literacy, social, emotional, and approaches to learning. The DRDP is also on several states' menu of kindergarten assessments to choose from, 
We're also aware of some counties in California who have used the DRDP kindergarten tool in their programs. The CDE is making changes to the DRDP to be more inclusive of TK so that programs may more readily adopt it. For example, you saw that we have a preschool version and a kindergarten version, but we've heard from teachers that many TK kids either fall on one or the other depending on their developmental level. So we are now combining the tool into one to cover the broader developmental trajectory that children may be presenting in TK. We also plan to add structured prompts in math and literacy, which are essentially direct assessments, but still embedded in a child's learning experience and can be administered in a small group setting. We're also extending the DRDP to third grade in the domains of social emotional development and approaches to learning. The hope for this tool is to demonstrate the value of these domains of development in the early elementary years. As referenced in the item, currently 29% of LEAs are using the DRDP and TK, but we hope that this tool becomes more accessible for TK programs in the future. The last thing I'll cover in our assessment section is the LPAC requirement. For both TK and kindergarten, an English language proficiency assessment tied to grade level standards is federally required for students in public schools within the first 30 days of enrollment. The LPAC is based on the kindergarten English language development standards. However, as TK is expanded to younger four-year-old children, we will need to explore how to implement the reading and writing sections in a developmentally informed and in an effective manner. Since the board's purview is over assessments in the LPAC, we wanted to flag this for you. The final aspect of TK implementation we want to highlight is support for the workforce. While the board does not have authority on workforce requirements or investments that support the workforce, an understanding of the needs and current efforts are important given the essential role that educators play in TK implementation. So TK teachers must meet the requirements in statute by August 1, 2023. And these requirements include holding uh, a number of credentials, one of a number of credentials, including a multiple subject credential, general kindergarten primary K3 credential, um, or others, and additional expertise in ECE or child development. To meet the ECE requirements specified in Education Code Section 48,000 G4, teachers can get 24 units of coursework in early childhood education or child development, have professional experience comparable to those units, or have a child development teacher permit or the upcoming pre-K-3 ECE specialist credential. As of July 1, 22, the Commission on Teacher Credentialing can issue a one-year emergency specialist teaching permit in early childhood education. These emergency specialist teaching permits in ECE, also called emergency transitional kindergarten permits, um, assist LEAs that are not able to recruit a fully credentialed teacher for a TK classroom. As more children become eligible for TK, another aspect of implementation is the need for additional teachers. The Learning Policy Institute has estimated that as many as 20,000 TK teachers will be needed for full implementation in 25-26, which means that LEAs must recruit and hire another 12 to 16,000 teachers in the coming years. In addition, statute requires a 1 to 12 adult to child ratio in, in TK starting this year. And given that TK is a maximum class size of 24, that means that beginning in this year, every classroom needs a second adult. At present, that equates to approximately 4,000 additional adults. But by full implementation in 2526, up to 20,000 staff members will be needed in this role across the state. The UPK Planning and Implementation Grant Survey asked LEAs to report what strategies they are planning to use to support their local workforce in meeting these requirements. Uh, districts and charter schools are already planning a number of efforts to support both prospective and current teachers. In this table found on page 25 of the item, I want to highlight that many districts and charter schools are working in partnership with institutes of higher ed and their county offices of education to build the pathways per, for those prospective teachers and to support current teachers. In addition, LEAs report logistical support is available in many places with advising on requirements, information on scholarships and grant opportunities, and in about a quarter of school districts and charter schools, stipends for teacher tuition. In addition to the required qualifications for TK teachers, professional learning is an essential part of a quality TK program. Teachers, leaders, and staff will continue to grow as educators, particularly in applying the science of learning and development in their classrooms. Ensuring that ongoing opportunities for all involved in TK and early education of coaching, resources, and mentorship will strengthen their competencies to understand and meet the developmental needs of diverse learners. 
areas of focus for professional learning include social emotional learning, language and literacy development and instruction for young children, math and science development and instruction, the preschool learning foundations, and the use of developmentally informed curriculum as highlighted previously. Other areas for professional learning appropriate for TK educators as well as P3 educators and beyond can include anti-bias teaching, mitigating implicit bias and reducing exclusionary discipline and practices such as suspension, trauma-informed practice, healing and restorative practices, serving children with disabilities, and supporting multilingual learners. This table highlights the percentage of school districts and charter schools planning to offer professional learning opportunities in their plans, or in, in seven areas related to developmentally informed practice. Uh, this, the great news is that more than half of school districts and charters have already included each of these areas in their plans. The strongest responses are for professional learning in literacy and language development, social and emotional development, with serving children with disabilities in inclusive settings, curriculum selections and implementation, and math and science instruction close behind. If you look at Table 12 and Attachment 3 of the item, you will see a few other topics for professional learning, such as effective adult-child interactions, supporting multilingual learners, using trauma-informed practices, and engaging culturally and linguistically diverse families, uh, which fall under the 50% mark, but more than 35% of school districts and charter schools plan to include them. In addition to local efforts by LEAs and their partners, significant investments have been made at the state level uh, to, uh, to support meeting the demand for qualified teachers in TK and beyond. These investments allow LEAs to spend money on teacher and staff recruitment and hiring, as well as offering financial support to current teachers and opportunities for future teachers to follow pathways into TK. Additional investments have been made specifically to increase the availability and accessibility of professional learning for TK and their teachers, such as the UPK Planning and Implementation Grant, the Early Education Teacher Development Grant, Educator Effectiveness Block Grant, the, which is administered by the CDE and provides $1.5 billion in apportionments through June 26 um, to support um, professional learning for teachers, administrators, and paraprofessionals who work with students and classified staff that interact with students. To provide accelerated reading support, the, the current year budget allocated $15 million in one-time funding over three years to support 6,000 teachers. Um, and, the 20, and the current year budget also established the Golden State Pathways Program to support LEAs to partner with higher education um, community groups and employers to promote pathways. The Commission on Teacher Credentialing also has a, a couple of grants, the, including the Teacher Residency Grant Program, um, the one-time grants for four-year integrated teacher uh, preparation programs, and the California Student Aid Commission. Last one I'd like to highlight here is the Golden State Teacher Grant Program an ongoing grant with $100 million in funding for fiscal year between 21 and 26, which provides up to $20,000 in individual grants to students in CTC-approved uh, professional preparation programs to commit to working in high-needs fields, such as TK. Uh, one last investment in the TK workforce that is important to talk about is the PK3 Early Childhood Specialist, Specialist Credential, which we will discuss in more detail now. Well, briefly now. The PK3 ECE Specialist Credential is a specific investment that will support the TK workforce, as well as other early education programs and overall P3 alignment. The focus of this credential is the developmentally supported practices and instructional strategies to support children from pre-K to third grade, and ensuring that teachers can build the types of quality learning opportunities and environments that support whole child development, build on prior experiences, and integrate children's experiences characteristics, assets, abilities, and needs. The credential standards and teaching performance expectations for the PK3 ECE specialist credential were approved at the October 2022 CTC meeting, and the regulations for this credential are currently being developed by the CTC with the Office of Administrative Law with an anticipated approval in January 23. And for closing, I'll hand it back to Sarah. And we know this has been a really long item, very thorough, so I will just wrap it up. TK and UPK are tremendous achievements and opportunities to provide children in California with positive learning experience through a strengths-based, play-based approach to joyful, engaged learning that supports their emotional, social, cognitive, and language development. 
California also has this opportunity to implement a P3 frame, thereby creating greater potential for lasting school outcomes by adopting the science of learning and development principles and whole child approaches into those early grades. And while we didn't have time today, we do wanna hire two other essential areas that we will cover in our item more deeply tomorrow, at least one of them in special education. The importance of inclusion in the inclusion of children with disabilities in both TK and our California State Preschool Program. Our Director of Special Education, Heather Kellamese, will dive into that a little bit tomorrow in the Special Ed Annual Performance Report presentation. Additionally, we really want to emphasize the importance of supporting our multilingual learners and ensuring that as TK expands, so do the supports and programs that foster home language of multilingual learners along with English acquisition. That is so foundational as we think about all of our children to create that sense and culture of inclusion and belonging. We also wanna acknowledge the governor's 2023-24 proposed budget includes the next year of funds for TK expansion, which means many more children will benefit for TK for years to come. Finally, we wanna celebrate the California's historic investment in UPK with UTK as the foundational component is an investment in the future of California. It creates a monumental impact for children who participate, their families, and their communities. Supporting children's development and foundational learning in their early years can increase their success in school and in life, promoting positive health, career, and social outcomes in adulthood. Building up these strengths in children builds strengths in their families and their communities and provides social and economic benefits to society as a whole. This concludes our presentation. So I'll hand it back over to our board chair, um, um, Darlene Hammond. Thank you so much, Sarah and Stephen. The extraordinary uh, work that you are doing is really visible uh, across every dimension of TK across a very complicated mixed delivery system bringing coherence and thoughtfulness to all of these elements with multiple agencies, including CDE and um, the CTC, uh, DSS, et cetera. So we're, we're very uh, grateful to you for all of this effort. We're going to uh, go to the public comments slide uh, and get the public comment queuing up right now. Uh, those who'd like to call in, can use the telephone number and the access code provided on the slide that is shown now. Um, I'd like to remind everyone of the framing comments I made at the beginning of this item and the state board's you know, particular um, limited authority in this space. And while we're waiting, I wanna ask our member, uh, Patio Bronson, if she would like to kick us off with some comments. Thank you. Um, so I also just want to join uh, our board president in thanking Sarah and Stephen and also Superintendent Thurman uh, for not only an incredible presentation, but for incredible leadership and tenacity in rolling out what is an entirely new grade in California, which has not been done in a couple of hundred years. Um, so it is... <laughs> historic moment um, and, and one that has required um, an incredible uh, amount of labor, but I think it has been a labor of love. So I'm just incredibly appreciative um, of the work that CDE has undertaken in order to actually move this forward. Um, I also just wanted to um, reflect on, on uh, an earlier comment that our board president mentioned about the scale of this program. Um, this will be the largest uh, uh, pre-K program for four-year-olds in the country, um, and also just even to put it in the broader context of um, the multiple um, investments that the governor has made on the early side of early learning, um, inclusive of the state preschool program and child care, at full implementation, California will be overseeing more early learning, early care and learning um, seats in California than the entire of the federal government's investments in Head Start across all 50 states. So it is an epic undertaking and it is, I think, incredibly exciting and, and just want to um, salute the work that is being done across the multiple agencies to make that happen. It is also, I think, equally important uh, to recognize that it's it's not just a scale undertaking. Many of the impacts that Sarah um, talked through in terms of school rec, in terms of academic, um, social emotional learning 
are all incredibly helpful. Um, and the the data point that always I think stays with me is from getting down to facts around this idea that <clears throat> even though California's um, school districts are actually beating national averages already in terms of annual growth for the K-12 students, because so many kids in California start in third grade almost a full academic year behind, the catch-up is very, very difficult. Um, and so the early learning uh, investment, I think, that is being brought forward with UTK is really an incredibly important strategy for making sure that all of that good work that's done in the later years um, does not have to be catch up, but can just be progress, um, which is obviously, I think, what, what all kids and families uh, and supporters of public education want. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll just say is that I, I think across a number of um, the points in the PowerPoint, uh, Sarah and, and Stephen both mentioned that this is a P to three uh, frame. And so this is work that connects um, not just for the year of UTK, but has implications um, and for ongoing work and coordination um, with three trajectory. So that is super exciting. Um, I, the, I keep thinking of Kamala Harris um, saying that uh, she was it, it was she was the first, but not the last. Um, and I, I think this will be the first um, sort of moment of thinking for so many school districts about how to work with early learning, but it certainly will not be the last. Um, and there's lots of exciting work ahead. So thank you guys again. Thank you. Um, I think unless there are there any clarifying questions um, that need to be asked now, and then we'll get to go to public comment and come back for discussion. Um, Vice President Glover Woods. Thank you. Uh, just a quick clarifying question. Is the LPAC currently administered to our TK students? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Right, and that question will be in front of us as we get to younger and younger four-year-olds. Um, okay, I see no other hands at the moment, so let's go to public comment if there is some. Uh, yes, we do have one caller in the queue. I will open the phone line now. Okay. Afternoon, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute, your time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, Jessica Sacco on behalf of Children Now. We applaud the progress the state is making towards offering UPK to all four-year-olds. We are pleased the board has made space in its packed agenda to receive an update and provide their perspectives on this important education initiative. I applaud Deputy Superintendent Sarah Neville Morgan and her team for the deliberate framing of the work before us as universal pre-K, made up of transitional kindergarten, CSPP, Head Start, expanded learning, and private preschool providers, in full recognition of the unique early learning and care needs of young children and their families. Progress to date is significant, and there are still several implementation issues to be addressed, which we describe in our letter. I draw your attention to the role the state board and department can take in supporting and retaining the existing teacher workforce through promoting the utilization of educator effectiveness funds to support teachers in improving and growing their craft as younger children enter TK classrooms. Similarly, the content and curriculum for TK classrooms must evolve to meet the developmental and educational needs of children as young as 48 months who will become TK students by 25, 26. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, that concludes public comment for item number 10. Thank you very much, uh, both for that amazing presentation uh, and uh, the thoughtful public comment. And now is there board discussion. I remind you, this is an information item. It's gonna set the table for the work that we may need to do in the future, um, but there's no decisions today. Any comments or questions? Member McQuillan and then Vice President Glover Woods. Yes, thank you. Thank you for this item. It's, it's really exciting where we can uh, uh, capture additional children to have a preschool experience, uh, those that might be missing. Uh, I'm so happy that we included Head Start too and in the discussion and coordination. Um, I have a question on, uh, is there any type of uh, recommended number of minutes or time um, for the PK programs? Thank you. Sarah or Steven? 
how you're thinking about the time frame? There's rec there's required minutes um, mm -hmm. as part of TK. So I think it's 180 instructional minutes, but I'm getting confirmation on that. And then, of course, the way that it's framed is to be uh, incorporated in uh, to the extent possible full day program. Do you want to speak to that, Sarah, as well? Yeah, so it's uh, 180 instructional minutes or 36,000 minutes a year. And that's within, as you look at the expanded learning opportunities program, the nine hours of programming if families so choose. So that if the TK program is part day or school day, you can still have some hours of the expanded learning program coming around that. Or in some cases, they're using the California State Preschool program or even Head Start to partner with for those. So just to the um, layers of complexity, um, there are part day and full day programs and then extended day um, wraparounds that are all being coordinated. Um, anything else? Okay, uh, member Glover Woods and then member Yoshimoto Tari and then member Rodriguez. Thank you, um, Stephen and Sarah. Thank you so much for such a comprehensive presentation and a comprehensive board item. Um, it's just very refreshing to be able to have conversation about what's happening with our, our littles, if you will, um, and how critical that is to all of the other things we look at with grad rate and ELA and math proficiency. Um, that foundation really starts with our, our youngest learners and what we do to support them. Uh, so I more this is more of a comment, not a question at all, but just to emphasize a statement that was in our board item which was that as we're thinking about transitional kindergarten and the curriculum and the practices, that it's really about looking at taking those practices and pushing them up through K and through three, as opposed to taking those education, the elementary practices, let's say in first and second grade and pushing them down. It's going to be really critical. Um, it's already been critical for transitional kindergarten because we've had that grade. For, for a little bit of time as we saw in the timeline. But even as we expand it now to younger four-year-olds, it's going to be critical that the curriculum and assessment is not kindergarten light, but that it is actually developmentally appropriate for children coming in at that age and to set them up for success. So thank you again for your presentation and I look forward to more conversation on this topic. Thank you so much. Um, I think next is member Yashimoto Tauri, then member Rodriguez, and then member Olkin. Uh, that was so articulately said, uh, Vice President Glover Woods. I, I'm not going to repeat that uh, in my own words because uh, that was that's part of my concern. This is a proud moment. Uh, it's very, very exciting. Uh, and I would extend, you know, to connect with what you said, oh, my wondering, I suppose, about the bridge between, you know, mixed delivery UPK, including transitional kindergarten, uh, but also being under the per TK being under the purview of the SBE, uh, just to the conversations around uh, state frameworks coming up in the future, which have connections to state adoptions for K-8, and wondering how we might be able to uh, really have a seamless bridge, you know, uh, particularly in the mixed delivery model, so that we're ensuring that there are developmentally supportive and appropriate expectations for our TK students, but also for students that are in other uh, programs in the mixed delivery model who will be joining their peers uh, in the second year of kindergarten and elementary school. And so uh, I look forward to that conversation, which doesn't need a necessarily a response today. Um, particularly around the um, the curriculum and you know the, the adoption pieces. Uh, and then secondly, and maybe this connects with the conversation tomorrow. Um, so maybe a comment uh, and not necessarily a question at this point, but I noticed in the uh, supporting documentation that uh, first was excited to see that for the state preschool contracting agencies that the set aside amount for students with disabilities is increasing in the coming years, um, each year, just a little bit more through 2024, 25. 
and that we expect that to increase um, the percentages of three or four year old students in, in state preschool with IEPs. Um, but that also that we didn't have the data on um, how many students in our state preschools were having that inclusive experience yet. And so I was wondering about what are like what the next steps are to be able to capture that data or maybe perhaps what the barriers are that need to be problem solved. And I'm happy to wait till tomorrow if that's more appropriate. I'll do just a, a tiny response and then we can captured a little bit more over there. So first about the preschool learning foundations, we so agree and it was wonderful to hear that. They are required for use in our California state preschool program. And a lot, I would say probably in California, all of the Head Starts also use the preschool learning foundations as well. And then a lot of our Title 22 sort of private pre-K programs also access them. We make those freely available. So there is much more expanded use of those across the state. Um, so we'll see greater and greater alignment. And then as we look at our littles with disabilities and including them, one of the things that happened in this current year, so sort of last year's budget cycle, is um, better data collection. And so not only will are there requirements around pulling out TK as a separate indicator and grade, basically, to follow that, but there are some around California State Preschool Program and our LEAs where we will get it, the student identifier, and that will also help us understand a little bit more about the children. So that is something we continue to look at within CDE as we look at what we call results count and wanting to use data to then inform our practice and how we're supporting our programs more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Member Rodriguez. Um, yes, I have so much to say and I'm filled with excitement, but I'm just going to keep it at my, uh, hats off my applause to everyone who has uh, gotten this initiative this far. It's been a lot of work. I remember um, during Governor Newsom's first election, he talked about how important it is to close that achievement gap in zero to three and, um, you know, and, and seeing this uh, come to fruition just uh, fills me with joy. So thank you. Thank you to everyone at every level. Terrific. Uh, Member Olkin? Um, I just want to echo the excitement. Um, and also, um, you know, I, I was struck by, there was a slide about developmentally supportive curriculum. And there was sort of a list of things that um, a classroom should include or the curriculum should include that was developmentally appropriate. And it was small groups rather than direct instruction. And, um, there's a whole list. Um, and um, what I noted was those are all the same things that I think are developmentally appropriate uh, at the high school level or the middle school level um, because they're so informed by the science of learning and development. And um, so the thing, one of the things I'm most excited for, and this is maybe a little um, just based on the context in which um, I've worked professionally is the ways in which the science of learning and development are driving the 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 way we're in we're, the way we're building the program the the way the credentialing is going to be um, established the thinking around classrooms the thinking about curriculum and that that's not just TK but making its way up through third grade um, and hopefully really um, impacting the rest of our TK pro. TK through 12 program as well. Um, I just think that's a huge, um, hugely exciting development for the state of California that we have this opportunity to um, have the science of development be at the starting place of our program plan rather than coming working backwards and trying to figure out how to fix what we've um, inherited and was not planned around the way young people learn um, all this time. So, yay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Member Patillo Bronson. I, I just was uh, prompted in hearing both Sharon um, and Allison's comments about the curriculum frameworks um, to just flag that there are opportunities, I think, ahead to think about how, how to incorporate um, 
things from the preschool learning foundation more explicitly. Um, the power of those frameworks oftentimes moves mountains and publishers and <laughs> uh, wanting to to um, sort of take that up in the future um, around how to make that more explicit and al make the alignment not just legislative intent language, um, but more more explicit and uh, seamless. Yeah, I noticed when we were when um, Sarah and Stephen were talking about the uh, curriculum and the nature of developmentally appropriate practice, so many people had smiles on their faces. So <laughs> it is uh, something that you know we want to. Um, build on uh, throughout the grades. Uh, well, this is an inspiring uh, and informative session. It is an informational session. We will have other decisions down the road. We really appreciate it. You gave us a wonderful, inspiring end to our uh, first board day. And um, with that, uh, seeing no further discussion, uh, I wanna thank Sarah, I wanna thank Stephen, all of the staff at CDE who have been involved with this and in the other agencies who have been collaborating uh, and our state board staff as well, who have uh, uh, really helped to facilitate some of the um, actions that were needed to start this program off on such a good foot. Uh, tomorrow we will meet in closed session to discuss and or take action on the following legal matters, Mark S versus state and Napa Valley Unified School District versus SBE. I hereby continue the meeting and end today's session at 3.14 p.m. Wow, go party and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. <laughs>